All right, Mr. President, if you're okay, I'll go ahead and start ro calling roll. Please, sir, let's go Go ahead. All right, I'll begin with the board members. Um, Jason Burdine. Here. Allison Drew. Allison Drew, can you hear me? We'll come back to her, Dr. Dupree. Addie Helliger. Here. Grail James. Here. Jim Rice. Here. Dave Rosenthal. You're muted, Dave. Here. Gwen, um, Kristen Tossan. Here. All right, let's go back to Allison Drew. Here. Thank you. All right. All right, do we have a board counsel Rick Morris on the line yet? Okay, we'll check back on him. Then staff, um, Deanna Saavedra. Present, I'm here, Dr. Dupree. Brian Gwynn. I'm here, Dr. Dupree. Anthony and Delicato. I'm present. Thank you, Dr. Dupree. Beth Martinez. Here. Good evening. Oscar Perez. Here. Here. Long Thumb. Long. I'm here. Joe Rodriguez. This is Joe. I'm here. Robert Scamardo. This is Rob Scamardo. I'm here. Veronica Sofer. Veronica Sofer here. Gwen Touche. And um, David Ryder, police chief, will not be with us this evening. All right, uh, Mr. President, everyone is accounted, president accounted for except for Rick Morris at this point. Thank you, he Dr. Said, Dr. And he did chat saying he's having trouble with his mic, so he is, he's rebooting to rejoin. Okay, thank you very much for letting me know. The time is 6 o'clock p.m., and this meeting is hereby called to order. We have the presence of a quorum attending a video conference. Notice of this meeting has been posted online for at least 72 hours. On March 16, 2020, Governor Greg Abbott granted a request by Attorney General Ken Paxton to temporarily suspend a limited number of open meetings laws to the extent necessary to allow telephonic or video conference meetings in response to the coronavirus COVID-19 in accordance with, the, with those suspended rules. Fort Bend ISD certifies the following. Although members of the board are not gathered in a central physical location, we do have a quorum in attendance at this meeting by video conference. This meeting is being held by video conference because the convening at one location of a quorum of the governmental body is not appropriate during the COVID-19 public health emergency. Based on current guidance from federal, state, and county authorities concerning large gatherings and social distancing during the COVID-19 public health emergency, there is no established location for an audience to observe the meeting. However, the live meeting is audible and accessible through a YouTube link that was timely and appropriately provided to the public and media as part of the meeting posting through a, new, through a news release and via the district website. As we would at any in-person meeting, members of the public who have followed the standard instructions for registering to speak during the public comment portion will be allowed three minutes to speak. All other meeting procedures will adhere to board adopted procedures to the extent 
practicable. An audio and video recording of this meeting is being made and will be available to the public on the district's website. First on our agenda this evening is our information items. 2A1 is our School Health Advisory Council end of the year report. Dr. Dupree. Yes, sir. Um, we're, I'm gonna ask Beth Martinez, our Chief Academic Officer, to open this report. She'll be um, introducing other speakers, including the chair of our district, Shaq, Erica Bernard. Beth? Thank you, Dr. Dupree. Good evening, board members. This evening, Dr. Pilar Westbrook, our Executive Director of Social Emotional Learning and Comprehensive Health, along with Lori Sartain, our Assistant Director of Health and Wellness for the district, and Erica Bernhard, our School Health Advisory Council, or SHAC, Chair will provide an update of the SHAC's work, inclusive of updates to policy FFA local, which is also on this evening's agenda for board review. It's important that you know that during the last several weeks, more than ever, as we navigate the experiences of COVID, we know the importance of supporting the mental health and well-being of all of our students. While there are five 2019-2020 SHAC goals, there is not a specific goal related to mental health but it is important to keep in mind that we are focused on and intentional about supporting the mental health and wellness of our students. Policy FFA, which you will review this evening, includes references to the district's wellness plan, promoting the general physical, mental, emotional, and social wellness and safety of all, all of our students through nutritional education, physical activity, and other school-based activities. Specifically, the section of the policy titled Other School-Based Activities provides information related to mental emotional wellness. And we will work with the SHAC to create administrative procedures in support of the mental health and wellness of our students. We do expect to recommend additional policy FFA revisions for board consideration during the 2021 school year as we further define the work of the SHAC's subcommittee associated with social emotional learning in alignment with the needs of our students and the work of our SEL department. With that introduction, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Westbrook for further introduction and the beginning of our presentation. Board of Trustees, Dr. Dupree, Beth Martinez, our Chief Academic Officer, thank you so much for having us this evening. I'm gonna go ahead and just say thank you very much to all the SHAC members. They're gonna be listening in um, to the presentation simulcast. And so thank you to all the members of the SHAC who have participated this year in helping to collaborate across all the areas of health and wellness, whether mental health, behavioral health, physical health, nutritional health, social, emotional, all the areas that we encompass, they've worked hard to make sure that those were included in what we do. Tonight we have Erica Bernhard. She is our chair of the SHAC. Erica, can you wave so folks know where you are? Hi, everyone. <laughs> Hello. And she and our Assistant Director of Health and Wellness, Lori Sartain, will be presenting on the SHAC information review for the board for this school year, as well as speaking about a few items related to their review of FFA local policy related to SHAC's work. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Lori Sartain. Good evening, Dr. Dupree, President Verdeen, and members of the school board. My name is Lori Sartain. I'm the Assistant Director of Health and Wellness here in Fort Ben ISD. I also serve as the School Health Advisory Council or SHAC coordinator. The School Health Advisory Committee or our SHAC is a parent and community advisory group mandated by legal and local policies. The majority of our SHAC members are parents. The remaining members include district coordinated school health representatives and community members. Before we start our presentation today, I'd like to recognize our SHAC chair, Erica Bernhard, who you just met, and all members of the SHAC committee for their service and their commitment to coordinated school health here in Fort Ben ISD. <laughs> State law requires the SHAC to submit an annual report to its local school board. Tonight, we'll be reporting on the following topics. Click. The Fort Bend ISD SHAC mission, the WISC wellness model and how it aligns to the board goals and the Fort Bend ISD profile of a graduate. The Fort Bend ISD virtual healthy schools or VHS program implementation, community partners, SHAC district wellness analysis and recommendations, and the SHAC request. Click. 
As you may recall, last year we presented the SHAC mission, which was updated in August of 2019. The Fort Bend ISD SHAC shall use the whole school, whole child, whole community WISC model. The board trustee goals and the Fort Bend ISD profile of a graduate attributes to support the Fort Bend ISD district community for the purposes of effectively implementing the district wellness policy of FA local while promoting evidence-based wellness resources that encourage and foster lifelong wellness of staff, students, and the community. Click. As you read the SHAC mission, or I read it to you, it focuses on ensuring a coordinated effort to align the Fort Bend ISD wellness policy, the Fort Bend ISD board goals, and the objectives, core beliefs, and the profile of a graduate while implementing the whole school, whole community, whole child, or WISC model. The CDC and ASCD developed this model five years ago to provide school districts with a framework for student-centered approach to growth of the whole child. The handout we provided you with shows you more clearly each of the 10 wellness tenets that are shown in this model surrounding the whole child. During the 2019-20 school year, the SHAC has worked diligently with district administration to increase collaboration and alignment around the WISC model. We have also worked to educate Fort Bend ISD staff and parents about the WISC model and community programs to increase utilization of these valuable resources on our Fort Bend ISD campus. At this time, I will turn over the presentation to our SHAC chair, Erica Bernhardt. Thank you, Lori. Good evening, everyone. And thank you for allowing SHAC time to present to you tonight. Last year in May, we presented the WISP model during our end of year report. Next slide, please. We could not be more pleased at how this model has started to be integrated into Fort Bend ISD school board videos, in the board goals, and in the wellness information that's being passed on to our campus administrators. As stated in our mission, the SHAC will continue to work with the entire Fort Bend ISD community to ensure we remain focused on the full realization of the WISC model in our wellness programming and to meet all the needs of the whole child. At this time, I would like to thank Grail James, the Fort Bend ISD School Board representative who serves on our SHAC. Thank you, Grail, for all your time, your insight, and your willingness to collaborate with our SHAC members. I want to personally thank you for your wisdom and guidance with which I could not have effectively served as the chair for this amazing group of individuals. Thank you very much. In May of 2019, we used the WIS model that you see to categorize some of the wellness activities and programs occurring throughout the district, of which there are many. The purpose of this was for the SHAC to identify wellness programming in Fort Bend ISD in relation to the 10 WISC areas of content. Of course, this analysis model must evolve into one in which we can use procured data to accurately evaluate the implementation, the growth and the effectiveness of campus-based wellness programming in, from year to year. Further, SHAC needs this data to accurately evalu evaluate how the programming fulfills the requirements of the FFA local wellness policy as is part of our legally mandated duties. Over the last two years, Lori has been working with campus administrators to develop an analytical tool that will provide the campuses with data to help recognize wellness growth and needed improvement areas. These campus wellness recognition surveys will give the SHAC and the district data to use to effectively conduct the required triennial assessment of the FFA local. These wellness surveys align with District Goal 1, Objective 3, regarding implementing an assessment system to monitor and measure growth of student wellness for growth of students, campus, and the district. Sorry, I can't get my page to turn. Uh, next slide, Gary. The FFA local SHAC recommendations are as followed. Development of administrative procedures to direct the work around wellness evaluation and compliance with the policy, the FFA local. Addition of mental health and wellness, assessment of implementation by child nutrition, providing parent education, use of food not as a punishment and only as a reward in such special circumstances to be identified, provide adequate time for students to eat meals, and addition of recess guidelines. 
Next slide. There are three keys to success of continuing wellness growth in Fort Ben ISD. Historically, Shack has worked to enhance all three of the above elements within the district. First and foremost is collaboration between the district and the community. We've had a wonderful amount of collaboration this year. Resources is another element. So we've worked to create a centralized wellness resource repository and a designated position, someone to be in charge of all of the things surrounding the whole child or a WISC specialist. Next slide. As I said, the first element needed is community partnerships. While the school may be the place that we focus our wellness efforts, our district remains a reflection of its community priorities and resources. Wellness within the district requires community input, resources, and collaboration in order to support its students. Shaq would like to thank all of our community partners in helping to identify, implement, and grow our wellness offerings. What you see listed here on the slide are just a few of the community partners that Shaq works with to promote and encourage health and wellness in Fort Bend ISD schools. Thank you all for your support of the wellness efforts in Fort Bend ISD. I'd like to especially thank Stephanie Kellum with United Healthcare, Sandy Bristow with Oliver Foundation, Sandra Castro with Dairy Max, and also Harris County Public Health Department for their partnership and continued involvement in growing our wellness offerings. Without your passion and commitment to the students in Fort Bend ISD, wellness would merely be a concept. Thank you all so much. I'd also like to thank Dr. Dupree, Diana Saavedra, Dr. Westbrook, Lori Sartain, and the rest of the Department of Social and Emotional Learning and Comprehensive Health. Also, Julia Jarrell, Registered Dietitian, Brianna Garcia, and the rest of the Child Nutrition Department for their support and unprecedented collaboration. Lastly, I want to give a shout out to Tynese Blackman and Collaborative Communities Department for all their wellness efforts involving the Fort Bend ISD community. It truly takes all of us working together to grow the whole child. Next slide. The second element for success that was mentioned is a centralized wellness resource repository. Fort Bend ISD Shack created a resource model based on the CDC Virtual Health School, or the VHS, to put wellness resources at the fingertips of our campus administrators and WISC heroes. I'd like to let Lori speak to you about the resources she initiated and has been building this year. The Fort Bend ISD VHS is housed in Schoology and the district has worked diligently to build the VHS with evidence-based resources and program information, many of which have been sourced through the SHAC subcommittees. The VHS has been rolled out to principals during monthly meetings and principal newsletter communication as a resource for developing campus improvement wellness strategies. The number one obstacle we have identified from principals is they lack the time to source this information, especially for wellness areas in which they need to see growth. These growth areas may be identified through different means, such as student surveys, Naviance data, pride survey data, or from recommendations initiated by our new student wellness coalition. Wellness resources will continue to be added to the VHS to support campuses in all areas of wellness. SHAC will then solicit success stories and recognize campuses and individual WISC heroes for their wellness efforts. Thank you, Lori. The SHAC would like to ask the district to help us identify funding so that we can look to grow this resource beyond the Schoology platform so that the resources and programs would be available to parents and the community at large. Many foundations offer innovative grants based around wellness efforts. The third element we feel is necessary to continue the growth of wellness in Fort Bend ISD is a district WISC specialist whose main job focus is the coordination and implementation of district WISC initiatives and the triennial evaluation of FFA local. The time I have dedicated to serving as CHAC chair, chair over the past two years has been very gratifying. It has become very evident though that the amount of time required to execute all of the duties to run the SHAC, including soliciting and educating members, managing subcommittees, staying abreast of valuable community programs, disseminating information, meeting with campus personnel, students, and parents, developing strategy, working on the triennial FFA local assessment, 
development of the VHS and working to initiate and mentor our new student wellness coalitions amount to a full-time job. Added to this is the time spent looking for funding for campus wellness programs and working to develop a grant timeline as a district resource. It's mandated that the two-year term position of the Shack Chair be held by a volunteer parent. And while we don't disagree that the chair should be a parent, the fact remains that the position requires a daunting amount of work and knowledge regarding district operations and WIS community programming. At this point in time, the Shack Executive Board feels strongly that it is necessary to hire a district employee whose skill set and especially their passion are centered on wellness programming to grow the whole child, to take over many of the duties currently performed or coordinated by the Shack Chair. The following are the prominent duties that the Shack, the Shack Executive Board has identified as responsibilities that would be desirable as part of the job description for the WISC specialist. Next slide. Oh, I'm sorry, Gary, can you go back? Uh, the WISC specialist would lead the triennial evaluation of the FFA local. They would ensure resources such as program information, funding, and best practices are shared with campuses. They would identify WISC programming and professional development for district implementation, and they would coordinate with district, district executive directors and SHAC to ensure strategic planning is shared and aligned. Next slide. In summary, the School Health Advisory Committee has three requests for the Board of Trustees and Dr. Dupree to consider. First, the creation of an FTE district employee the WISC specialist dedicated to identification of WISC programming, wellness grant information and application, ensuring communication and collaboration between all relevant persons and departments and coordination of the FA, FFA local triennial assessment using statistical performance analysis. Second, a commitment to research and apply for grant opportunities and or allocate funds to build a digital format of the Fort Bend ISD virtual health school so that all campuses, the Fort Bend ISD community and district administration can have access to wellness tools and best practices in one easily accessible resource. Thirdly, we would like to request more funding to be allocated to grow the whole child in Fort Bend ISD. Examples of program this funding would be used for are campus-based wellness initiatives such as action-based learning labs, Playworks recess, recess coaching services, exercise equipment, transformational seating components, stress reduction areas for meditation, yoga, and educational programs that teach students and staff about common mental disorders, such as the documentary Angst that was screened in Fort Bend ISD this last school year. All of these resources will support the learning environment to grow the whole child in Fort Bend ISD. Next slide. Next slide, Gary. Thank you, Dr. Dupree, President Berndine, and members of the school board for the opportunity to present the ongoing efforts of the Fort Bend ISD shack around the WISC wellness model. We would be happy to answer any questions you might have at this time. Thank you, Mrs. Bernhard. We really do appreciate you. I wanted to thank the committee, the community partners, and all those involved with the shack. This is extremely important to us as a district, and I know there's a lot of hard work involved, so we can't thank you enough as a board. Um, Mrs. James had a question whenever you're ready, Mrs. James. Thank you, Mr. Verdeen. And uh, I just want to say, uh, as Erica mentioned, I've been serving on the shack for a couple of years now, and I want to thank uh, all the parent volunteers that serve. Uh, and it's quite a commitment, and they do a fantastic job. We have a lot of staff members that um, participate as well, uh, and they also do a fantastic job, and everybody brings their own area of expertise. But um, the parents do it as volunteers, and that's, that's a big commitment. So uh, I want to thank them for that. And I particularly want to thank uh, Erica and the executive board. Uh, Erica has put a tremendous amount of work in um, over her la the last couple of years as the president. And uh, her, you know, it's a lot, her vision, this virtual health, um, uh, health school model to have those resources available to uh, individual campuses. And uh, she, she worked hard to bring that to life. And, Lots of staff I know worked with her, but she was really a driving force behind it. So I just want to really give a shout out uh, to Erica. Um, 
she brought up something I think that's really important and I don't know how we, um, how we should deal with this. Um, that the job of being the chair and really the job of the executive board is pretty overwhelming. Uh, there's so much to do. Um, and I know we may not, I don't know what our financial position is and, and, and what solutions we might be able to have to this. I'm not sure that we have the resources right now to hire a person to take over to help. Um, but we do need to figure out something because we're relying exclusively on parent volunteers and we have a great thing going. As in our shack is a model for shacks in the state. As in uh, we are just knocking it out of the, you know, knocking it out of the park. But it's not sustainable if we, if we put too much burden on parents and parent volunteers. Um, and I know Erica has had a lot of challenging personal things in the last couple of years that have really stretched her, including job changes and changes in her family and everything. And it's been really a lot. And I uh, just want to thank her again. Uh, but let's think creatively about how we can support the parents because um, you know, I want to keep the, the positive effort going. The second thing I want to comment on, it, a couple of the speakers brought up, but I want to bring this up to staff um, and reinforce it. Um, we don't have a developed section in the proposed FFA on mental health. Um, I do think that mental health, and I think it's clear in terms of the board goals, in terms of the board effort in um, fundraising, I mean, in, in fund allocation, the emphasis we've had on mental health in the boardroom, uh, the student groups we've heard from, the student wellness groups that are starting and their emphasis on mental health. I feel like this is an important component that needs to be um, considered and added to the policy. I don't, I say that with hesitation because the, the policy is what the shack uses to frame their work. And we don't want to uh, overburden the shack, but by the same token, I think they can, the shack can be a valuable partner in um, helping us in collaboration for our mental health efforts. We've already seen some collaboration happen um, in, in programming and in conversations in the shack meetings. And I think that uh, all the internal staff efforts that are taking place around mental health, I think that's a, there's a, some synergy that needs to happen and some connection. So I would just encourage staff um, to look at that really carefully. Um, I think those are all the things that I wanted to comment on. Uh, again, it's been a privilege to serve on the shack. I appreciate all their work. Uh, they've done a really, really terrific job. And Erica, uh, your leadership is, is, has been um, exemplary and it has made so much of this happen. So thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you, Mrs. James. Mr. Rosenthal. <clears throat> yes, sir. Thank you. Um, I'd also like to thank the Shack Committee for all this incredible work. Uh, especially the volunteers, we, we really appreciate all your time. This looks like a really uh, a really tough job, and um, it's uh, it's uh, just amazing what you all do. Uh, a couple of questions. Uh, I will start with um, uh, piggybacking on what Miss James was talking about, and that's the policy uh, FFA. So. Um, this is this is one of these policies that did not come through the policy committee. So uh, in preparing for the meeting, I was reading over this and um, I have a question and concern. And if you actually look at page two of FFA local, uh, there's something in there under student welfare, wellness and health services. And it, it says prohibit the use of food as a punishment and allow the use of food as a reward only in special circumstances. This is something that was just brought up in the presentation. Um, and uh, the, the food as a punishment part, I have no problem with that. The, the uh, reward uh, only in special circumstances, 
Um, I kind of wondering if we're being a little too strict on that one because a lot of teachers, uh, myself included, when I was doing that, um, would uh, sometimes during class, like if you're playing like a Kahoot game or quizzes game or something like that, you know, you might uh, open up a pack of Starburst and, and whoever answers the questions first, you know, you have little games and whatnot. Uh, you throw a lollipop or a little starburst or something like that. But this would prohibit that because it's not part of an individualized education program, behavioral intervention plan, or as part of a tiered intervention plan. So uh, I think we need to consider maybe rewording that a little bit because I don't want teachers to, um, to violate board policy and get in trouble. So um, I, I, again, that's not something, again, if, if you're doing that every day, okay, that's something, that might be something different. So I think this, this, um, this deserves another look. So um, the other thing uh, that I wanted to bring up is, uh, let me scroll back up to the presentation. When looking at the um, WSCC program, I'm wondering if, um, Human trafficking fits in here somewhere. Uh, I know that um, some of you uh, attended a presentation back in October um, with Child Proof America, and this is something that, that um, uh, I wanted to bring to the admin's attention at that time. And so I'm wondering um, if this is something, if, if this is where this would fit in, or if there's something else uh, where we would make students and parents aware of that. Um, if I can just comment for a moment on your first point, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. um, I've been a registered dietitian and certified diabetes educator for going on 25 years now. And one of the biggest obstacles I face with my patients who are overweight, overweight or have comorbidities that they're suffering from is that they eat when they're not hungry. And it's a big challenge if you look at the evidence-based data that we have a 30% and growing amount of obese children in the United States. I would argue with you that there are plenty of other wonderful things such as praise, extra recess time, all kinds of documented um, rewards that would serve just as effective a purpose and be healthy for those children rather than offering candy. And while I do, I do realize that teachers are used to that and the kids like it. I think with adequate, adequate professional development and the national resources that are available, um, and we've submitted quite a few of those resources to the social emotional learning department. Um, I think that teachers can find ways to um, supplement those practices and do something that actually is more beneficial for everybody. So we, we have provided some of those. We'd love to send them to you and have you look at those also. Sure. That would, uh, that would be good to have that conversation. Uh, I'd also like to get, to make sure that we have buy-in from our teachers as well, because they're the ones in the classroom. So, but yep. I appreciate that point of view. You bet. All right, Mr. Rosenthal, is that it? Or no one addressed the second part of your question. Beth, yeah, I wonder if somebody can address the second part of Dave's question. Can you repeat that? Uh, my screen, uh, my mute on. Um, yes, we, we can certainly address that and, and make sure that we get that. Um, it, it, it relates to the safety and well being of our students. And we have plans in place and, uh, in fact, have an upcoming board update to provide to you on the efforts associated with human tra trafficking. So we can certainly ensure that that's covered in the, in the appropriate policy as well. Great. Because, you know, every, every student who has a cell phone yes. is basically, you know, at risk of, of that happening to them. So um, yes. we need to make sure that we educate not just the students, but the parents. And uh, Mr. Rosen. So yep. we've also worked on SHAC to develop possibly a fifth subcommittee that would deal with um, human trafficking, health and safety. We actually asked uh, Chief Ryder if we could have his public information officer as a member of our SHAC uh, for next year. And we've already initiated that um, so that we can really look at those issues um, also related to child abuse um, 
uh, health, immunizations, other things that our, our nursing coordinator works on also. So that hopefully will be forthcoming so we can collaborate with the district on their goals around that. Right, right. thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you both very much. Um, Mrs. Tossan, do you have a question or a comment? Yes, thanks, Jason. Um, so I, I also wanted to, first of all, thank you guys for this uh, very thorough, um, very well thought out, and very professional presentation. You were succinct in your requests and in sharing information with us. Um, and I especially appreciate that. And thanks for all your hard work. We know what it means to be a volunteer, especially in, in putting together important policy like this and um, important guidelines for us to follow um, for our kids. So thanks so much for that. Um, I, I too am really interested in seeing what other recommendations you have. Having a daughter with a disability who um, did have food written into her behavior plan. Mm -hmm. And to this day, even at 20 years old um, at Texas A&M, she's taking, you know, nutritional classes. I do think the nutritional aspect and teaching our kids the nutritional value of foods it, is very important. But I also know that, um, you know, sometimes taking that, that particular reward system away um, it can be difficult. So, and, and I appreciate that we've left those exceptions in there. Um, but having worked in the disability world and behavioral world um, for many years, I know that a lot of our kids um, may not necessarily have an IEP or a behavior plan in place, but um, parents will come in and offer suggestions for helping their kids with behaviors that they're going through, even they're, though they're not under the umbrella of a plan. So, um, and, and maybe that falls under the exception and that's fine. I just wanna make sure that we're not hindering our parents and teachers from offering some of those solutions um, when others, uh, you know, are, are, are not working. Um, but I know for me as a parent, um, I had to pick my battles and, uh, you know, we, we gave her M&Ms because we just weren't, you know, it was a battle that we just didn't want to fight because there were so many others for us. Um, but at the same time, we really wanted her to learn good nutrition and, and other ways um, to self-motivate and things like that. So I, I absolutely think those, are, those things are important as well. But, um, you know, Dave's point's well taken. So I think this is a good conversation for us to have. Um, I'd love to see the additional ideas, um, and I'd love to get our teachers involved in that and um, see if we can't um, move us in a direction that's really balanced. Um, but I think they're really good thoughts. I also wanted to piggyback um, and just provide support for Grail's idea about the mental health and wellness aspect. It's something that's been very important to this board and um, to the extent that the shack um, can help us with that, and uh, particularly when it comes to um, ex you know expanding ideas or, or coming up with ways to support our kids. Um, it's really one of those things that's uh, of great importance, particularly in this day and age, and you're dealing with kids with um, you know access to devices all day long. And um, I, I really think that that adds to a more mental and emotional issues that our kids go through. They're isolated, but not isolated, uh, you know, kind of to Dave's point. They always have a device in their hands and it exposes them to a lot of things. Um, dealing with peer pressure in a way that we didn't because they're constantly on Instagram and, you know, seeing all those other things out there that their peers are um, engaged in. I think those, those would be great things to have feedback on and to make sure that we're doing everything we can to support our, our kids. Um, so I just wanted to, to kind of give that support to my colleagues and, um, and also uh, support to you guys and all of your efforts and everything that you're doing to help uh, advise us and advise the administration. So thanks for that. No real questions though. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Thank you. Can I just say real quickly that I think to that point, our student wellness leaders who are exemplifying the profile of the graduate have stood up last year and asked us to create wellness coalitions that will talk about not only the situations that you just spoke of, but also hereditary mental health disorders, such as panic attacks and other things that it's important for staff and students to understand 
um, how those come up, how those affect academia, how they affect relationships. Uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding. I know we have it in my own family and I have high achiever kids. It still creates an obstacle for them. So I think those students will really um, help us to understand what it is that they need working with those student wellness coalitions. I'm super excited about those. I think that's a great point. And I think that the more we can talk about it, the better, because then it beca doesn't become a stigma and our kids are hearing more about it. They're understanding not only themselves more, perhaps, but their peers more. Um, and I think we're finding more and more of our teenagers have some form of pressure or another, and maybe they don't even understand why their own feelings are the way they are, why their reactions are the way they are. And I think it's, it's important to provide that peer support and just where they can talk about it more. I think that's fantastic. So thanks for sharing. Thank you, Mrs. Tossan. Were there any other board members that'd like to make a comment or have a question? I'd like to say one thing. If nobody else, I, I don't know if anybody else does. But not to aware. Go ahead, Mrs. James, go for it. Well, I just wanted to um, build on the mental health because we have a lot of parents who want to learn also. And um, I think, as I've said a few times, the more times that we can use the vocabulary, get the vocabulary out there so people can talk about it in a real way, just like how we talk about the symptoms of COVID-19 or the symptoms of the flu or whatever. Let's talk about the symptoms of mental health so that we can create a community awareness. And um, the students are asking for it, the parents are asking for it. So uh, I think it's important that we follow up on it. So thank you. Thank you, Mrs. James. I, I agree the ability to define what mental um, illness is, I think is extremely important. Um, I also wanted to make just one last comment that Mrs. Tossan, Mrs. James, and Mr. Rosenthal all touched on, and I really like the idea of having one of Chief Ryder's um, officers to be on the, on the committee. Whenever I think of mental health, I think of school safety. Mm -hmm. Those go hand in hand, and so um, there needs to be a bridge there, so I'm excited about there being a bridge in the future, it sounds like. So, um, and Mr. Rosenthal mentioned human trafficking. Um, and I know that was touched on a few times, but I, I think that's important as well. So I just wanted to make that comment. Mr. Bernie, I would like to, I want to, if you don't mind, I'd like to get some clarification from the board on a couple of issues. Okay. I mean, were you finished? I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Were you finished no, with no, your no. comments? Go for it. I wanted to, and just and since we've this we placed this um, policy on the agenda recommendation for approval next Monday, I did want to get clarity among the board about, uh, for our next steps. Um, Mrs. James, you mentioned the mental health aspect, and I just wanted to make sure that as a board, you all are are good with looking at that during the twenty one so during excuse me during the twenty twenty one school year, perhaps for further revision next year to updating the policy further for mental health rather than trying to to do that quickly during the next few weeks? Or, or is the board agreeable to that or would you provide different direction? Yes, I'd say that sounds agreeable to me. I think it's better to think it out um, and, and figure out, and, and maybe this touches also on the workload on Shack. Maybe some effort goes into defining and rethinking the workload on Shack and what the priorities for Shack are. Mm -hmm. um, and then fitting this in because um, I'm concerned about adding one more thing to their load and then that's even more overwhelming. So I would just say maybe that's just a holistic review that could go on. So I, I'd be in favor of going forward with the policy as it is now and revising it over the next school year to add these other important components. I also think it's important to know that the let legislation that was passed down with the 86 legislate legislator I'm <laughs> sorry I can't say that legislative body um, does speak to mental health suicide prevention opioid use and some other things and Shaq has already considered those we actually have it in our strategic planning for the beginning of the school year with the social emotional learning department to talk about curriculum around those things so it, it we, it's already been on our uh, list of things that we will be considering 
good. There is also, we're also working on three additional policies related to those topics as well. So I think it would be good to align all of that work um, through the policy committee and the shack kind of all, as we get into next fall. I would agree with that. Very good. I um, wanted to speak, sorry. So, it, uh, so regarding that, I, I'd, I'd still like to, to bring us back to that, that statement in that policy regarding um, uh, I just your food as a reward. Yes, because yes, sir. I, you know, and that was my next question. I wanted to ask the board's view on how to handle that um, for next week. So, so my suggestion would be just as far as policy goes, um, would you know you can maybe change that to say with the goal um, of eliminating that. But I think to just next year come back and says okay nobody can do that anymore i think you're going to get a lot of resistance i, I think you're going to get a lot of teachers who uh, haven't been trained on some of these other uh, ways to to do that or don't understand that or um, uh, just don't see an issue with it if it's done infrequently uh, and again, I, I completely understand, you know, the, the, the reason, the rationale behind that, uh, the language that's currently in there, but I'm just looking at it from a policy point of view. And um, do we wanna, you're gonna have, if, if that's in policy, somebody's gonna have to enforce it, mm -hmm. right? That's the whole idea. Uh, well, <laughs> you're correct. It's, it's, it doesn't matter to have a policy if it's not enforced. It's just words on paper. Well, again, so, if, if you're going to enforce it, then you're going to be a, a lot of teachers are going to are going to end up maybe getting in trouble with that until people start to get used to it. I think part of the part of the way we're approaching this is to give recognition to those schools that move ahead with these things over the next three years. It's not enforcement in a punitive way. It's enforcement in an educational way to encourage them to look at the alternatives. Right, and that's, so, that's, that's what I was saying, because, but that's not how it's written. That's the thing. So well, we have to be real careful with policy because the words that are written there actually mean what, they're, what they say. And so I, I agree with you, okay? But uh, I think we're kind of moving toward the same thing. But as it states right now, um, a, a teacher could get in trouble for, you know, passing out a, a piece of starburst um, so I think I think we need to we need to just carefully consider that I agree with you I just like to say one more thing not to be argumentative but there are also other things in the policy in the past that we have not had enforcement and we have not measured so I think instead of just singling out that one thing I think we need to look at our enforcement procedures and that's something that dr. Dupree is planning on doing over the next year working with Shaq and the district to work on how exactly the new, we used to call them regulations, but the new actual way that those things are um, administered on campus is taken care of. So I agree with you. I think it's a, it's a difficult situation to enforce, but I think everything in that policy, you could find some place that it's not enforced. And so I'd like that not to stand alone. I feel very strongly that obesity sure. among our children is a big problem. No, it is. I, I think, yeah. Okay. You, you can actually start looking at it since, since we're talking, you know, we're in the middle of this pandemic, you could probably apply obesity to a lot of the numbers that you see across the world and, and probably show that that's, um, that's part of the, the discrepancy that you see between different, different countries and here. So I agree with you, you know, um, but I'm just looking at it from a policy and enforcement uh, point of view uh, because it's it's board it's, it becomes board policy so you know we're the ones that you know it's kind of like it's coming out of our mouths so um, I understand right so but, <laughs> but I we, we agree there's probably there's probably other policies as well that that maybe there, there's procedures for right um, but may not be enforced you know to the letter either so you know i think that's where the where the work needs to go in the future really as everyone develops their wellness policies it's a new thing i think if we can look to be proactive about it and as we do set the trends for other school districts right i think we can be very proud of that but i agree we do have to be yeah. careful about you know how what we say about enforcement right all right 
I, th I think we're pretty much on the same page. Thank you both. Mrs. Tossan, did you have a quick comment before we move on? Yeah, so I just wanted to say that I agree with Dave so, uh, because um, while the while reality may be that things are in policy that are not being enforced, as a trustee and a governing body, if I put it in policy, I expect it to be enforced. If you or someone else tells me that something is not being enforced, then that's a problem. So while there are things that may need, we may need to go back and look at and make sure that, that they are being enforced and make sure that we're, uh, I guess, ensuring that they are and putting procedures in place to make sure that they are, then, then that's what we need to do. But I'm not going to be in favor of putting something in a policy that we don't intend to enforce or that we think we can't enforce. Um, so, and because I do think we need to ensure, um, I 100% agree about, you know, childhood obesity and, you know, I, I really think we should be educating our children on nutrition, you know, positive nutritional choices and alternatives and those kinds of things. Um, I, because I think we're about student ownership of learning. And so part of that student ownership of learning is ensuring that they know what their choices are and they're making appropriate choices and they understand what it does to their body and why it's not a good choice and those kinds of things. I think all of that's really important. Um, but at the same time, I don't, I, I'm, my focus is more on the behavioral child and ensuring that we have those resources, or at least have a good strong policy in place that allows for those exceptions. Um, so I would want to make sure before we put something like that's this strongly worded here that we've, the board has gone through um, the process of, of looking at everything that you have and then maybe maybe specifically stating those exceptions um, and then we can feel like we can strongly word it and enforce it um, once we our, our teachers understand we've maybe done some professional development Dr. Dupree and make sure that our teachers understand what's expected of them and educate them on what some of those alternatives are um, I, I think I would agree with that but um, the fact that other policies aren't being enforced, I don't think is a good um, good reason to do this. I think we need to make sure our policies are being enforced. <laughs> I mean, that's mm -hmm. that's that's our goal and that's why we put it in policy. Um, so that that's all I had. Thank you, Mrs. Tossin. Uh, Dr. Dupree, does did that answer your question? Yes, sir. I know how to proceed. We will right. um, we'll we'll work with staff and gather the information from Mrs. Bernard and also kind of see how we can work with the language to maybe make it a goal or a transitional type of conversation but still honor the integrity of what the shack is trying to achieve great thank you very much i appreciate that once uh, again can i make another comment though i'd like to make a comment on this because what what training or what professional development do we have in place on this topic? Are we training, uh, Dr. Dupree, are we training our teachers on um, alternatives to food-based reward? You know, I, Lori, do you, have we done anything like that to your knowledge for Pilar or Beth? I would ask Lori, can you address that, Lori, please? Sure. Um, with the creation of our new SAL and Comprehensive Health Division, we have created a um, behavioral framework, which um, we are educating all campus staff on. Um, unfortunately, the launch of that was supposed to happen April 13th with all staff, but that's kind of in the situation we're in, it's been kind of pushed back. So that is definitely um, one component of what we want to include when we're talking about, you know, positive behavior supports within the classroom. Oh, okay, so um, so that's a good, that it kind of fits then into what Dave and Kristen are saying in the sense of if we don't, our teachers don't have the tools they need, then we're, we're, we're setting ourselves up not for success. So uh, Dr. Dupree, I'd like to suggest that there's a bullet that starts with on the second page, and if we can maybe, it starts with prohibit the use of food as a punishment. I think mm -hmm. we can all agree with that, and that goes speaks to the practice where we had 
staff prohibiting children from going to lunch, say, until they finished their work or things like that. And we don't mm -hmm. want that to be the case. And then maybe we separate this into two bullets. So we separate the two concepts and then we can add a, a, a sentence about train, a, a training sentence in there, which can, which can be our, can be our aspirational piece. And then we can, you know, cause there is the language already, the use of food as a reward only in special circumstances. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that seems appropriate to what we've been talking about. So I think it could be easily modified is I guess what I'm getting to. I, I agree. We'll, we'll get that taken care of for next week. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate the, we appreciate the, uh, the conversation and the presentation and thank you again to the chat committee and all those involved. Uh, with that being said, we're going to move along to our third quarter financial mm -hmm. report. Dr. Dupree. Yes, sir. Um, we provided the board a, a preview document um, a, with uh, some analysis. I'm going to ask Brian to just highlight anything in that report. Um, just any updates he has to share. Thank you, Dr. Dupree. Good evening, Mr. President, members of the board. The financial reports uh, results in this report are for the third quarter through March 31st. I don't have a formal presentation, but I will walk you through some of the key highlights. I will start out by saying that some of the information in this report does include the first impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, and I'll point that out as we move, I move through my comment. I do also want to uh, provide some reassurance and say that we do not anticipate a significant impact on the general fund in the current year. And next week, I'll have a more comprehensive report on how we anticipate ending the current fiscal year in a three-year forecast through 2023. But this report is solely focused on how things are going this year. And as we previously reported, we have seen a decline in interest earnings due to the federal rate cuts that occur occurred. Those occurred prior to the pandemic, and those declines were offset partially by the receipt of insurance proceeds for Hurricane Harvey. And then before I discuss the performance of some of the funds, I will point out that we did receive a FEMA payout on an Ike claim this fiscal year. It was the final payment. And I highlight that because as we go into reimbursements for the COVID expenditures, it could be in some cases a period of time before we actually receive those reimbursements. So I would just like to remind the board that sometimes the timing of federal reimbursements can be extended. But uh, quickly on the general fund, this is on page six of the financial report. Through the end of March, both revenues and expenditures were tracking with budget and were at similar levels for the prior year. And as I mentioned a moment ago, we're not anticipating that our response to the pandemic will change our projection from ending the year in the black. The child nutrition fund is one area that is being impacted by the pandemic. Local revenues, which are the student payments for meals are down due to campuses being closed for the entire month of March, essentially. And we'll have more information on how this fund is expected to the end the year during our budget update next week. And we're not expecting any significant fin financial impact on our federal grant funds, debt service, or bond funds due to the pandemic. However, our enterprise and print shop funds, which were performing well prior to the pandemic, will see reduced revenues. As you're aware, we closed those all facilities to rentals when we returned from spring break and printing demand has been significantly reduced due to the shift to online learning. So we're expecting our print shop will run a deficit budget as, as it has throughout the year. However, there is a significant fund balance in the enterprise fund that can offset that loss. And then, as I mentioned a moment ago, we will have a more extensive update for you on next week on how we anticipate ending the current fiscal year, as well as the outlook for 2021 and beyond. And I'll be happy to answer any questions on the financial report. Mr. Rice, did you have any questions or comments? I do. So, um, Mr. Gwynn, I'm going to repeat what I heard you say briefly, and you're, you're going to go over this again next week. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Are you going to share the presentation that you prepared with everybody? Yes, sir. We'll have a formal presentation for the board next week that will include not only how we anticipate ending this year, but how things are anticipated for 2021 and beyond. Okay, because I think it's helpful, especially for those folks who are looking in to, to be able to see that. But uh, just briefly, I'm hearing you say that for the 2019-2020 school year, which we're in right now, 
we're we're in good shape. We're actually going to have we're going to exceed uh, our revenue estimates. Is that right? Yes, sir. We do anticipate breaking even. Part of that is because we we based our budget on seventy seven thousand kids, and we actually had enrollment of seventy eight thousand kids. We got some more funding for that. Um, is that true? Yes, sir. In addition to that, we also had some a slightly higher property value growth. We budgeted for 5%. We came in slightly over 5.5%, and that's yep. contributing to that increase as well. So we budgeted for 5% and came in at 5.5%, which helps us. And Paul Betancourt's cap of 3.5%, is it 2% 2, 2 for school districts? 2.5%. 2.5%. And what is it for municipalities? Three and a half percent for municipalities. He's punishing school districts by an extra percent. But his draconian cap doesn't go into effect for the first uh, several years of, of his edict. Is that correct? It will go into effect next tax year, sir. Next tax year. Yes, okay. sir. So um, here's my other question. We've got uh, when the legis the 86 legislative legislature met and did they fund their whole budget for two years they had the money to do it. it that's my question did they have the money to actually fund us for two full years yes sir the the biennium budget was funded for two fiscal years so the funding for schools would be included in that funding for both of those years okay so we should be good for next year too and i think that's what i heard you say Yes, sir. That is our understanding and the signaling that we are currently getting from the state. So this year, um, I know that we're, of course, we're paying all of our teachers, our staff, we're paying everybody, but have our expenses dropped because uh, we're not running the buses. And so we're not using up the fuel for, you know, the second half of this, of the school year. Have we saved any money on, on transportation costs and utility costs? Yes, sir. We are anticipating to see those reductions. However, most of those costs are lagging expenditures, meaning that, as an example, an electric bill, when you receive that bill for March, it's for February usage. So we really won't see those declines begin to occur until April. But yes, sir, we are expecting to see declines in transportation costs, some utilities, the use of substitute teachers, that those costs should be declining beginning in the April time frame. So even though I know we've handed out over 5,000 laptops and I think 1,200 hotspots, we're serving 10,000 children with online learning that previously didn't have laptops or internet connectivity. We've had the funding to be able to do that. Are, are we hurting in that regard in any way from the financial expenditures? At this point, no, sir. And again, what we are expecting is that some of those costs are going to be offset by some of those savings that we just indicated. As an example, some of the airtime costs associated with the hot spots that you mentioned, that would be offset by some of our electricity savings. Okay, very good. And lastly, uh, next week when you delve into this, you know, uh, I know you go through this in a very professional and business-like way, but the, the, the manner in which we manage our long-term debt, uh, I, I am gonna continue to beat that drum, how well we do it and how much money we are saving our taxpayers. And I don't care if I sound like Mattress Mac, uh, I want everybody, all of our friends and neighbors tuning in to know that we are being good stewards of the taxpayers' money. And so we're going through this COVID-19 issue we're taking care of our kids, we're feeding our kids. I know we fed over 10,000 10, meals uh, just last week alone, uh, per day, per day. And uh, that's really something to be proud of. And I'm really, I'm really proud of the way that we, in a very sophisticated way, do refunding of, our, of some of our long-term debt. We have our commercial paper and our variable rate and I'm going to talk more or ask questions about it next week when you do the formal presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Rice. Uh, Mrs. Uh, James. Thank you, uh, Mr. Burdeen, and uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Gwen, for um, bringing us this financial report. 
My question was about, uh, Mr. Rice actually just kind of brought it up. I think I read uh, in the last couple of weeks that we made a, some bond purchase or maybe did some refunding, bond, uh, purchasing of bonds. Is that true? And what was the situation? Is that true? Am I, am I correct in that? Yes, ma'am. And I actually apologize for not mentioning that <clears throat> in my, my report because although it wasn't uh, impacting the, the March financials, it was a transaction that occurred at the end of April. On April 27th, the district did do refunding for about $160 million. That was a successful transaction. We ended up reducing our interest rate and saving just under $8 million in net present value on our interest costs. And that will extend, those savings do, of course, extend to taxpayers. And we had an all in interest cost of a little over, I think, 2.4%. So it is a significant savings that will benefit taxpayers. Okay, thank you very much. I just wanted to make sure that we got that out there. So, uh, and that's certainly in alignment with Mr. Rice's comments that we are being good stewards of the taxpayers' money. And uh, that will be even more important as we go forward um, over the next couple of years as we look, anticipate uh, how the situation of the economy will impact our, our, our financial situation. So thank you for your report. Thank you. Ryan, it might be beneficial for you to just update the board really briefly on your work with the county on the CARES Act funding that's coming into our area. Yes, sir. So the county had a task force meeting on Friday. Uh, the county is the financial administrator of the portion of funding from the CARES Act that will benefit the Fort Bend County region. It included school districts in the city. There is just over $134 million that's available to jurisdictions within the county. And they have a task force that uh, today submitted what the top priorities for funding are. And the one thing I would mention is that the funding is somewhat restricted in how it can be used. It's mainly to specifically mitigate the response to COVID-19. So personal protective gear, testing, and those types of responses are primarily what the funding will target. The district has submitted its priorities, including the feeding program and personal protective equipment, among other things that we would be looking for funding to receive. So, that committee will begin meeting weekly starting this week, and I'll provide more information to Dr. Dupree and the board as that information comes along. Brian, I probably sh I'm getting a message that we're having trouble hearing. Some folks are having trouble hearing you. Can you um, adjust your mic or something? Okay, is it better now? Is that better? Well, we'll wait. I think there's another question, perhaps. So. Do we have another question or comment for many board members? Yes, Mr. Verdeen. Go ahead, Mr. Rose. So thank you very much, Mr. Gwynn and Dr. Dupree. I would just simply ask, um, do we need to, uh, do we need to take advantage of this uh, funding that the county has um, or not? Uh, because if we're in good shape, uh, I'm all for, I know that we've expended funds with laptops and so forth, but if we're in good shape, um, I'm just wondering why we should participate in that program. Well, as I understand it, this is this is the federal money that has been allocated to our community um, by Congress. And so, as I understand it, they have designated the county as kind of the regional unit to accept the money on behalf of our community. And they are, what they've done is they've put together a as Brian mentioned, a task force that includes all of the school districts, Katie, Lamar, Needville, you know, all of the Stafford, all the school districts in Fort Bend County, as well as all the municipalities. And so the money is going to be allocated. And I absolutely believe we need to access our full share of that money that's available to us to the full extent, because we're the largest employer. We represent 78,000 students and all of the families that accompany those students. So if it can be used for things like PPE and feeding students, we're going to need access to all of those things during the coming months and perhaps even during the next year. So absolutely, I believe, um, you know, we're fine on our, on our operating budget and on our debt service budget, but that's a pot of money that's accessible to us. And I think we need to go 
for any aspect, any portion of that that we can to meet our local community's needs in, Fort, in the Fort Bend community. And Ms. Dr. Dupree, if I may, Mr. Rice, one of the things specifically mentioned in the CARES Funding Act is that the expenditures that you would seek to have funded were not funded within your operating budget as of March the 1st. So what we would be seeking reimbursement for would be expenditures over and above what we would normally make in an ordinary fiscal year. All right, thank you very much. I guess you say it just came about last Friday? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I haven't heard about it, but thank you for uh, getting me uh, clued in. Thank you. Yes, and that, that was one of the most, I mean, I'm going to be honest, I don't, I'm not sure when the county learned about it, so I'm certainly not throwing them under the bus in a negative light. But we only received a very quick invitation, I believe it was Friday, for Brian to participate in the meeting, and then he had to submit the priority list this afternoon. So it was a very quick turn, that, and that's why I, wanted, I thought it would be a good chance to update the board on that um, while we had your attention on our finances this evening. Thank you, Dr. Dupree and Mr. Gwynn for the update. We appreciate that. With that being said, let's move right along to our COVID-19 response update. Dr. Dupree. All right, well, I'm going to start that presentation. I'm, I'm gonna ask staff to join me as, as needed. Um, many of the things that you're going to hear, and I'm gonna be go through this relatively quickly, especially because a lot of it is not new information, but it's things that have happened since the last board meeting. And so I thought it would be good to have give the board an opportunity to hear and process this um, as, if, as needed. But then there are a few new things that I wanted to share. But the whole thing I want you to understand about most of this is there's not a lot of new decisions being made, but we are starting to look toward developing decisions for next year and beyond. So as I, as I begin the report, what I would say is that um, is that the we value our community partners. I wanted to get that out there loud and clear. We have had some substantial donations, contributions of just in-kind items, lots of support from our community for our children, some faith-based entities. The Houston Food Bank has become a regular, almost weekly partner in our community, thanks to the efforts of our co collaborative communities team. We've got a partner in Be a Champion, that is providing dinners to our students right now. So there's a lot of good things going on. And we're busy promoting those and celebrating those things through social media, on our website, and we're gonna have some kind of other formal celebration later. But you know, the board, um, even last week, and you, you reminded me of how significant and how important it is to the board that we continue to develop our collaborative communities era uh, depart in the department and that work and this has been a very effective way to do that almost a jump start honestly because a lot of people are coming to the table so I'm very pleased with that effort and we're going to continue to celebrate them perhaps in the boardroom one day with some type of personal board acknowledgement but for now we're doing that through social media and our website but we're continuing to to engage new partners on a weekly basis in regard to this spring um, Graduation, as you know, has been officially postponed to July 19th, 20th, and 21st. We're planning to do that um, at the Smart Financial Center. There's, we're planning to do a full-scale graduation as we normally do. If we're unable to gather, we will have alternate backup plans in place. Some, one plan would include having students only in the auditorium and allowing all the audience items to view online. And another would be a straight up all 100% virtual, but, but we're building alternate plans for that graduation to make sure that we can do our very best that we can to honor our class of 2020. Online learning um, and concluding the end of this year is where we've been spending a lot of time. As you know, um, we're, I guess, in our sixth or seventh week at this point. And I've talked to a group of principals Every, um, every week for the last few weeks. And what I, one thing that's emerging, the theme, is that things are going more and more smoothly from the campus level for the teachers and the principals. Now I'm gonna again say, not perfectly, because this is a challenge. Teachers are teaching with their own children at home. Um, their spouses are working. Many of our staff of all parts of the organization are dealing with their own personal issues, just like every other family in our community but I'm proud that we've continued to 
serve our students well through this process. On the flip side, though, we are hearing from more and more parents who are expressing concern, anxiety, and stress just about the, the amount of the work, what's required of them as parents, especially as the, the business community is reopening and more parents are needing to go back to work. So uh, there is a great deal of concern in the parent community. And we're listening, our parents, are they're engaging with the staff, the principals, the teachers. We're doing everything we can to keep them focused on the next three weeks of learning. We've got about 97% of our students right now successfully engaging, which is a great number. It's a very good, solid um, indicator of what's going on. Um, we've, as you know, we've issued thousands of laptops, hotspots. We're serving 11,000 students with issued district-issued laptops and 1,300 hotspots. So we're continuing to help our students connect, and we're reaching out to those students where we're not hearing from them consistently. The teachers and campus staff are doing that and then seeking support from district admin as needed. The last school is Thursday, May the 28th. Seniors um, will stop work on the 22nd as they typically would. And we're not having finals this year, but other students will continue working kind of wrap up on the 27th and 28th. Now again, in talking to the parents, many parents and community members recently, the question has been emerging, well, are you gonna go ahead and shut down the year early? And my answer has been no, um, because we are, you know, we've got to make the most of what time we have. It is difficult, it is stressful, um, but, we, but we know even we, if we can't get our kids in the classroom, we still need to be engaging with them online to the best of our ability, because everything they learn now matters and will be important as school continues. And I do believe, just as superintendent, that we are here as our community's public education entity. And so we're going to keep educating our kids to the best of our ability, partnering with parents, where our teachers are doing a great job of consistently adjusting their expectations as they get parent feedback, just to make sure we're honoring the needs of the family, and the social, emotional, mental health needs of the family to the best of our ability. That has still been our priority throughout this entire process. Um, I also would say that, you know, again, as superintendent, ending the year to me would send the wrong signal to the parents, to students, and our community about the importance of our work and our planning efforts. And so even though the, the efforts are taxing, our, our children, in my view, are worth the investment of our time and energy. And in many ways, our online schooling efforts present a teaching opportunity for our students to learn various aspects of our profile of a graduate as demonstrated by their own parents and the school staff as we, as we persevere and stick to this to keep learning going through the last day of school. So we do, you know, we, we've issued um, progress reports last week. We've done some good videos, good communication about that because again, that kind of raised some concern with parents about, well, we thought every kid was just gonna promote based on their T3 grade. But we've consistently said that T4, the fourth grading term, excuse me, does matter. And so some students did get a did not meet standard. Some received did not engage if they were not. But I want to again clarify that the intent of that grading system is not to be punitive. And we're, we're doing proficiency-based teaching and grading right now. So that means it's, it's extra important that students do everything they can to to demonstrate proficiency. And I'm being intentional about not using the word mastery because it is about proficiency, just learning the basics, the foundational pieces. And at the end of this year, what's gonna happen, um, the teachers will work with the campus administrators to determine, kind of do an individual plan, if you will, for each student. Some students would be retained. Most, we expect, would be promoted to the next level. But we also believe many students will have some sort of intervention plan required. And that would, could be as something as simple as a summer intervention through online means, online teaching, an online delivery system. It could also be something we need to do next year, how we organize the student's schedule or put them in certain classes to help them low, um, learn and grow. You know, I, I've, in most of my meetings with district leaders, I'm using as a good example, second grade. 
So in the last nine weeks of second grade, our students learn many important aspects of literacy that support them going into third grade. So we're gonna to have to figure out what child needs four or five weeks maybe of second grade instruction next year when they start their third grade year. Um, or, and would that, and would that um, instruction be delivered by the third grade teacher in a third grade classroom, by a second grade teacher in the third grade classroom, or would we ask them to go back to a second grade classroom you know, with the second grade teacher for a period of time before promoting them perhaps in September, early October next year. So you can see there's a lot of decisions to be made, but the bottom line is we know that we will be dealing with learning gaps and important student interventions throughout all of the next school year. So that's one of the most important things we're working on now is how to end this year with the right data and information so that we can um, from handle our students' needs best. Um, we have gathered information about grades that were assigned and we're gonna be providing a board an update on that um, in the very near future. Excuse me. So that's, so that's how we're ending this year. Um, as you know, AP exams and some of those things are taking place as well. So that's ongoing. We're working closely with um, the college board to meet our students' needs there. Um, our our um, Department of School Leadership is working on the schedules for book return, locker clean out, desk clean out, band instrument pickup, all of those things that you can imagine need to happen. And that all those details will be announced um, by May 15th. And that will, I've seen some drafts of that, that. So that's going to be coming from the campus very soon. There's also a number of activities our students engage in. All of that is on the website. Award ceremonies, fifth grade, eighth grade celebrations, proms, all of those things are gonna be handled at the school level. And we've got, we've up today created a website that includes a lot of important information that parents can continue to check over the next several weeks. After my report tonight, we're gonna to communicate more about many of these things um, during the coming days. Now I mentioned summer, that's kind of our midterm planning, rapidly becoming near-term planning that we've been working on. We do expect to offer summer programming um, for high school students who want to earn original credit. That would be the first time taking a course. They can do that through Edgenuity online. Um, and middle school students will be able to do that too for high school um, credit in certain courses if they choose to do that. That's, that's our usual standard. For our, our secondary students who need credit recovery, we'll also use Edgenuity in an online intervention during the month of June. That's the plan for now. <clears throat> now we're also discussing the possibility, and again, there's a lot of uncertainty around this, but we're discussing the possibility of offering special education extended school year services for many of our students in the school building during June and perhaps July. We believe um, some of those students have lost a lot of ground and we need to support them and their parents by getting them back in the classroom as soon as possible. Extended school year is something we do every year anyway. And so we think if it's possible to do that in small groups with proper social distancing and proper PPE, we're going to do our best to put on some type of program for those kiddos in June and July. Um, so I, the other thing I would say though, is for most all other students, we are not planning any July instruction. Um, due to the level of intensity of intervention that we're planning for next year, we believe our campus staff, our teachers need time to prepare, study student data, do PD, principals need to study data, prepare to lead their schools to a strong start and a strong year focused on interventions. So we are not planning to do any type of summer programming other than perhaps the extended year school for special education students during the month of July. And of course, teachers actually come to work, back to work the last week or so of July. Um, student feeding will continue. We're gonna pull back the number of campuses, perhaps. That's not a given yet. We don't know how long the state is gonna, and federal government's gonna authorize the, the expanded programming we have now for student feeding. So that is possible we might pull that back more to the more regulated programming, but at a minimum, we would expect it at 17 sites, whereas now we have many more than that. But we're also working with Be a Champion to continue 
serving our students meals, three meals a day. So that is something that's on that will be ongoing throughout the summer. Um, the other big, another big question we get about summer right now is what about all the student activities? So right now, again, we're not planning any activities like camps or anything like that in the month of June. It's possible, again, based on what comes out of the federal and state government, that we could do some student-based camps in July. Currently, we've scheduled things like the band leadership camp, quite, you know, some of the fine arts camps, sports camps, and those things that we do in July and early August. One way as an organization that we are supporting our community and our own staff is that starting Wednesday, we're gonna be reopening our extended learning program. They're gonna be offering all day childcare for parents who need that service so that they can go to work. Um, as of today, we had enough um, interest from parents um, expressed to open three campuses. And again, we're, we, the ratio of student to teachers is much lower than it usually is. I think it's five to one, so that we can maintain proper social distancing, protect everybody there. Um, but that's something we're gonna begin Wednesday and we're gonna open more campuses as we need to, to be able to um, serve our community as needed there. So the other big thing that keeps coming up and the most common question I'm getting right now is what are we gonna do in August? And so I wanted to speak to that a minute. There's two angles, two perspectives I wanted to share. First of all, as Brian mentioned, next week we're gonna to come to the board and talk to you about our priorities that we previously shared with the board in February and how that affects the budget. But I want you to understand the priorities we're gonna discuss with you are also affected by the staff's ability or inability to effectively plan for implementation. So a good example of that is the Hunter's Glen Early Literacy Center that we had planned to open this fall. Well, having not been open as a district with all of our energy focused on online learning, we do not believe we're gonna have the ability to effectively hire, train, and stand up that program by August. So we're planning to postpone implementation of the Hunter's Glen Early Literacy Center to the 21-22 school year. Now that being said, we're still gonna move forward with construction at Hunter's Glen that the board has already approved, and we're gonna hire the leader <clears throat> during, the, you know, during the summer for, the, for that campus so that we wanna demonstrate good faith that we're gonna move forward with that in a year but we do not believe we can effectively open that school this year. We do not have the time to plan well to implement that school. There, another thing we're changing has to do with the elementary planning. We had talked to you about a substantial investment in planning for our elementary schools to be able to um, have more um, out classes, PE, music, and STEM out class to be able to allow our um, teachers to have proper professional learning communities time, as well as more student interventions. Well, those two things are more important than ever as so many of our students are going to be coming back with a significant need for intervention. But we, want, well, we plan to scale back that plan by about 50%. So we still are going to hire the music and PE teachers that are required, which will give teachers what they need to be able to plan and conduct student interventions as originally discussed. And our principals and teachers have demonstrated enthusiasm about moving forward with that program. But we're gonna pull back with 50% of that programming in the way that we, um, we're going to use the librarians and expand the STEM out class. So we're wanting to demonstrate prudence in regard to our budget in these areas, but we also wanna demonstrate prudence in regard to staff required time to plan and execute. So that's one, that's a, but you're gonna hear much more detail about those things next week. And we are, for example, on the Hunters Glen ELC, we're gonna discuss that, some of that, that change with the, um, the community-based committee that helped us to plan that this week. We're gonna to talk to them a little bit about that. But, there, but the good news is most of the other things, such as the early college high school, the PTEC, 
um, those things are we're proceeding with because those are programs that are already underway that are substantially in, implemented. They're just incremental changes that we believe we can go ahead and move forward with. So there's a few big rocks like the two I've mentioned where we're making some nominal, well, they're not, not where we're making some changes, but then there's many other programs that we're going to move ahead with um, as previously discussed. Again, a lot of detail will be shared about that next Monday. Now, in regard to August, we've got um, what, what the common question is, what are we going to do? So the way I have been framing this, and this is what I wanted the board to, um, to, to get a handle on through my comments tonight. We're, we're planning, staff right now is planning three different scenarios. Now, again, we are in the planning to plan stage. We, we do not have details, but just, on, but on a high level, I want you to be able to understand we are planning a plan A that would be if all kids come back to school as normal. No change, school's open, first day of school, all the kids are back as usual with deep interventions to help close learning gaps. So that would be part of the scheduling and staffing. But other than that, all the kids would be there, normal class size, and away we go. Plan B would be if, if the virus is still rampant and we are still, uh, we have to keep our schools closed and instructing, we would have 100% online instruction again. Now there are some changes that we would have to make. Uh, I, you know, this, I mean, I just think to be candid, we would not be able to open school with the attitude of just do your best. And we're gonna give everyone met standard and not meet standard. Um, and come August, we would have to set new expectations for teachers, probably including even coming to the building, to their classroom, to deliver teaching actually synchronously um, on a day-to-day -day basis um, to their students. It would, I think we would have to structure differently now that we actually have time to plan and execute that. Um, but we would have to have grades because we can't go a year, a whole year without grading. We would have to have an equitable grading plan. We would have to have, look at equity across our schools and perhaps even use teachers a little differently across the district to serve more students across campus lines perhaps. There's lots of things we would have to really look at deeply, including um, the idea of small face-to-face -face instruction for, for special education students or those needing deep interventions. But it would, it could plan B would be for a substantially online program. Plan C would be a hybrid. We know based on feedback we're receiving that even come August, we're gonna have some members of our community who are not gonna be prepared to send their students back into a building with a lot of other kids, even if everything seems to be okay. So I think regardless of our best efforts, we're going to have to continue some form of online instruction it's just going to be a matter of how many students and what format that would take. Because if, if we're given direction from TEA, from the governor's office, that we can only have 25 to 30 to 50 percent of our students in the building at one time, or that we have to provide a certain type of social distancing that has a certain amount of space or limits a certain number of students in the classroom, then we know we would have some students in the building while other students are at home. And so we, we would have to be able to manage that. So that's gonna be our plan C is a hybrid model that might involve students being at school two to three days a week, at home two to three days a week, um, and learning and working, engaging with their teachers on a rotating schedule between distance learning and in school learning. So there's a whole lot of the planning that we're gonna be doing. Uh, and I just want you to understand right now, there's so many uncertainties that again, we're, we're building the plan to plan, the timelines, the project management task maps, and then we're gonna start laying out the milestones along the way for major decisions. And each board meeting between now and July and August, we'll be updating the board with our progress on this planning. As more information becomes available from the medical experts from the state and federal government, we'll, be, we'll begin to be, you know, get the bead on which plan we're gonna to have to implement and my money today is on plan C, a hybrid plan, but you never know. And so we're gonna be prepared as we have been to lead the way 
um, with, with making strong local decisions that serve the best interest of our students in our community while honoring their social emotional needs and honoring and respecting our staff's needs and supporting our staff to the best of our ability as well. Um, two more quick things that I wanted to share. First of all, we're getting a few questions about the FBISD administration building. When are we gonna reopen? Well, as of today, we're planning to keep district facilities closed through at least June the 1st. We are beginning to develop plans to stage reopening in June with team members splitting time between home and office. Um, because again, we want to be mindful that we cannot, um, that we cannot um, try to get everybody in some of our more densely populated areas all at the same time. We're trying to be respectful of the staff needs, their personal views, their opinions, as well as just their health, to be honest. So what we're planning to do is to begin kind of floor by floor, area by area, staging what that would look like. We'll be sharing those plans mid to late May. And then we're planning sometime in early June to start reopening our building. And that's important because as long as we're not functioning, um, Public Information Act requests, grievances, are not being processed timely. And, and that's, all in, that's all in tandem. And that's in pursuant to what's happening in the state right now. So it's not anything just that we're doing, but we do know we need to start resuming some form of normal building activity in central admin um, by June, if, we, if at all possible. Again, we'll keep you updated on that. I did wanna share construction is ongoing in our schools and our, I'm so proud of our maintenance and construction staff because as they are busy working doing a lot of the things they normally do during the summer, like the stripping and waxing floors, a lot of that important deep cleaning work, they're doing that now um, while the buildings are empty um, because we don't know what's going to happen. Right now, we do not plan to begin school before August 12th. Um, that's the first day you know, that's already been approved. Some that could change, but I'm not anticipating it well. We are gonna need all the time we can to get started, but I'm proud of the fact that we're getting, we're keeping the bond program going full steam ahead. Actually, I think getting a little ahead on some of those projects as well as some of the summer projects. So I did, I asked Oscar um, as our chief operating officer to just share a word about that piece because we did have a board member submit a specific question about construction and potential delays. So Oscar, if you would speak to that real quickly, that would be helpful. Yes, sir. So just to bring the board up to date, while students are not on campus, Design and Construction has been working closely with contractors to expedite work already under contract. And we're taking advantage of some of these that are under contract. And uh, we are getting in where there's availability at the campuses to get ahead. Also, Fort Bend ISD has not experienced any delays in planned construction for new schools, additions, or renovations. Contractors are maintaining all originally scheduled dates, which is real good to report. The other thing, and this is, this is a main highlight because it, uh, you know, as I go through this with my staff, I'm very proud of their work, but designing construction staff divided the overall work into 51 packages with 44 packages under construction. Three packages are currently awaiting board approval in May and four packages await bidding. The total budget for the remaining bond work is a little under 60 million and that is just amazing. Thank you, Oscar, I appreciate that. And like Oscar said about his team, he's proud of their efforts. I, have, I do have to take advantage of this opportunity. Um, I know you're gonna have some questions, but I, I also wanna, I have to take advantage of this opportunity to express my pride in our overall staff effort. Um, because we have had hundreds and hundreds of people, certainly the teachers, everyone at the school level is delivering every day. But I wanna make sure the board has a full appreciation in any community listening in just how hard people in central admin are working right now as well. Every department, every division is consistently delivering um, on lots of detailed plans to support our teachers and the principals and the entire school staff to make sure they have what they need. And every time I talk to principals or teachers, 
they are just a laudatory of how how helpful our central staff has been by thinking through every possible scenario, resources, job aids, training videos, resource, everything you can imagine they need to be successful. We have lots of people in central admin who are working to make that happen. So I'm very proud of that effort as well. And I, and I think, again, we're continuing to lead well in our community. We are, as I mentioned, at that turning point. I'm going to do, I'm going to do some new messaging this week. We're going to, we're going to touch again um, with a, a woman, one of our resources, Laura Jack, that has done some good work with us on compassion and the need to be compassionate to ourselves and to those we're engaging with because we want our students and our parents to know we want to continue that effort to make them feel valued and supported. We've done a lot of work with the principals and teachers on this, and we're going to continue to push that work. But we're also going to keep just expressing very gently the need to stay the course um, for the next several weeks to get to the last day of school. And then that everybody will get a little bit of time off, or at least the students and parents will, and some of the teachers. But district staff, I'm going to assure you, I know I've canceled pretty much all of my vacation plans for the summer. Staff, you know, I'm going to make folks take time off. And I'm going to take some time off, even if I just sit in my backyard. But I've told um, staff, we people have got, we've got to focus on wellness and everybody getting some breathing room, taking long weekends, taking some time off, because everybody is working hard. The common theme, I've heard some teachers express this recently, you know, it's one thing to go to an office and work where you're in your meetings, you're doing your email, but, and you've just got space to think and process at your desk in your office. But when you're at home, for many of our staff, um, they're, ne they're never off because when they're not doing their work, formal work for Fort Bend, a, a principal summed it up very well today. She says, I'm on a meeting and then I go feed my kid lunch and I'm in another meeting and then I go feed my, I lay him down for nap. You know, it's just, I'm either, she said, I'm either in mom role or principal role. And I think when she's at school, she's principal. When she's home, she's mom. But when, the, when, these, when they blend, it really makes it challenging. And certainly parents throughout our community are dealing with that right now. But as you know, but as CEO of this organization, my concern is the well-being of the 11,000 people that work on our team, in addition to those that we're serving. So just know that we're, gonna, we're really working hard to take wellness seriously, even in our own organization. So with that, I will see what questions or observations, comments, or feedback um, the board might have offer. Thank you, Dr. Dupree, for that thorough conversation. There's a lot of information there, and uh, we appreciate everything that you shared with us. Let's going to start off with Mrs. Tossan, whatever she's ready. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Burdine. Um, so I, I did have a couple of follow-up questions, but I wanted to say, first of all, um, just echoing what Dr. Dupree just said uh, is a massive, massive thank you, not just to our teachers and principals who are working under these conditions, but um, but like you said, Charles Central Admin, because I know when I've had questions or when community members have posed questions to me um, that I've passed on to you guys, you've been very responsive um, and working very hard to get explanations or answers, or if it's something that maybe wasn't thought about before, um, you've provided very thoughtful responses. So I just wanted to say thanks to the team that's on this call, as well as the team that's just listening in. Um, you know, I, I've emailed uh, principals and, and, and just, I, I just can't say enough about how responsive and engaged and, and just how hardworking everyone has been. So I just wanted to say that at the outset. Um, one of the um, questions that I sent in, um, or I guess yesterday it was, and, and Deanna provided me a, a pretty quick response to it, were these GT extensions. Um, I don't know if the rest of the board members are aware, but I have a GT student, and so I was a little bit concerned about you know, pr piling on work on our GT students, because as we've talked about a number of times in the boardroom, you know, it's not about more work. It's it's about um, different work. It's about ensuring, uh, you know, that we're that we're challenging or that we're providing a different learning 
opportunity for our students to have a different learning style. So um, I just want to say thanks, Deanna, for the for the uh, response that you sent. Um, so I do want us to make sure that we're um, ensuring that campuses are not providing more work. I did have an opportunity to look at what those GT extensions look like. Um, and and it, it did appear to me to be additional work instead of maybe different work. Um, so I, I would just ask um, that, you, that you guys and that our, our principals and teachers think about that and make sure that I absolutely agree with, you know, challenging our gifted students and making sure that they're um, having everything that they need, just like we do for our special ed students. Um, but I just want to make sure that we're not creating too much additional work for, for them. Because um, what I saw today, um, there we're requiring the original assignment in addition to the extension assignment, which is a, a separate submission and requires um, you know, more than the 30 minutes, for example, for science than would normally be required. Um, so, I mean, if it's give or take, it's not a big deal, but I just want to make sure, particularly our gifted students, you know, tend to carry the weight of the world on their shoulders a lot of times. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I just don't want to add to that. So, um, I wanted to throw that out there. I didn't know if Deanna, you wanted to respond or not. I mean, it's not necessary, but I just wanted to reiterate that and throw that out there. Well, we really appreciate your feedback, um, Mrs. Tossan. Um, that's how we continue to learn and grow. And so in my response, I shared, you know, what the intent of the extensions are and really the intent is not more work. It's really to challenge them as critical thinkers, to provide them with choice options and to have different modalities for them to express their, you know, their products and so forth. Now it's a work in progress. Um, we're working just as our teachers are trying to pivot and learn uh, the online piece. Uh, this has been um, new learning for them as well, but we do have systems to uh, go back and monitor. So we'll continue to work through that so that we can, um, as, as, as you said, make sure that we're meeting their learning needs, but also we're not uh, overburdening them with um, extensions that are not necessarily impossible, are not necessarily possible and may not be appreciate. So. Well, thanks for that. The feedback. I mm -hmm. get the, um, you know, I think the purpose is spot on. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that we were implementing uh, efficiently and effectively and appropriately. So um, thanks for that. But you sent me a lengthy email with, and I appreciated all of that. Um, and I appreciate all the hard work on making sure that our, our GT students are still being appropriately engaged. Um, my, I, my next question has to do with graduation and I, Charles, I, I think I texted you about this maybe a week or so ago. So I just wanted to, to ask again, um, I, I know our seniors and being a mom of a senior too, we completely appreciate um, changing the dates for graduation and trying to be sure that our students, our seniors uh, get to have a graduation. Um, and you, you said that, that it may look, you know, different, maybe only the graduates can come, maybe limited ticketing and that kind of thing. And I understand all of that. And you said as a, an alternative, uh, possibly having a virtual graduation, but I just wanted to see if you guys had talked about or thought about having an outdoor graduation as an alternative, given that we have two outdoor football fields. I, gr I graduated on the football field. <laughs> That's how we did it then. Um, that might possibly provide us an opportunity for some social distancing outdoors and allowing parents to sit in stands outdoors with some social distancing, um, if it comes to that, hopefully not. But have you guys talked about that and considered that? Joe, would you like to speak to that? Yeah, so we had uh, two meetings. Uh, one of the meetings was with students and the other meeting we had was with parents and that actually came up uh, from the parent group and their suggestion was just considering the amount of space that you, we would have in the stadium that we consider just allowing the parents to right. purchase tickets 
for the graduation. So that's one of the things that we're considering, but we are gonna have to uh, really take a look at what does that look like for some of our larger high schools. Um, we feel pretty confident that's uh, potentially an option for some of our smaller high schools, but obviously we do have two or three high schools that are extremely large in size and considering the amount of graduates and how many parents you know, we're going to have to consider uh, what that looks like. But we are studying that at this point in time, Ms. Tosa. Yes, and of course, my senior goes to one of those larger high schools. So I, I definitely understand uh, the potential challenges there. But I, I appreciate you guys studying that as an option. Um, I, yeah, I'd like for you to keep the board maybe updated on your work on that. Um, I know as a, you speaking personally as a parent, if I, I, I love that option over a virtual option, obviously, because it would give the students an actual graduation. Um, and, and we could also provide, you know, we always stream online and we could provide that option um, to just watch virtually instead of attend. But if we could at least um, have it where the parents and students could be there, um, I know I speak for a lot of uh, a lot of seniors and a lot of parents that that would be appreciated. Um, so my next question is, um, Charles, you talked about having extended uh, service ESY for our special education students in a building. Would that be in their homeschool building or are you guys considering doing it? I know it's normally not necessarily in the homeschool building, but in you know, consolidated into one school. Um, and the only reason I'm asking is because having dealt with this as a parent, um, we don't always accept extended service year because it's not in our students' home school and it presents additional challenges for transition where it almost hurts as much as it helps if they have to transition to a new building. So I'm just asking the question to see what you guys have considered. Um, Dina, would you speak to that please, or Deanna? Yeah. Um, yes, good evening. My name is Dina Hill and I'm the Executive Director for Student Support Services. And um, thank you, Kristen, for that question. You know, we're, we're really exploring all kinds of ideas, even considering um, could we do some, some instruction in the homeschool, but also even in the home. Um, we're wondering if there are students who and parents who would be welcomed for us to come into the home and provide one-on-one -on -one instruction, some have some real quality time, and if that might be a better way to serve kids for some of our really severe uh, students who's, who's really, whose families are, are really struggling. So, I mean, we're, I mean, we're considering all options. We're, we're a little bit concerned about what some of the kids with, um, you know, a lot of needs would look like in a classroom with with high aggression and self, you know, just some of the kids that have some really high needs are wondering if that might be a better uh, environment for them. Okay, great. Yeah, that's so that makes a lot of sense. Um, and I appreciate you guys thinking through that because I know, you know, as well as anybody that some of those um, You know, some of our kiddos, it poses a lot of challenges to put them in a new environment. Um, especially coming off of this sort of online learning, homeschooling kind of thing. Um, it, you know, I know we don't want to set them back anymore. Um, so we may have to get creative with some of that. So I appreciate you guys thinking through that, making sure we meet all of our students' needs. Um, so my next question is, um, I, I appreciate and I want to I want to just confirm what I heard you say Charles that you are not at this time asking for an extended school year so we're not while we may you you don't foresee us having to start school any earlier than the August 12th start date that we already have on the calendar but how we go back to school um, could look one of three ways either going back to school normally going back completely online or some hybrid, which is is kind of where you think we probably will fall. Is that correct? 
That's correct. And do, I do want to clarify, we're, we do believe some of our campuses, if not all of our campuses, will need to do some form of an on-ramp or jump start for kids who need intensive support, maybe the week or two before school starts. But we're not, we're at this time, there's no discussion about starting the school year before the August 12th official start date although we might engage some students for that. And yes, as you know, you know the, board, the um, legislature in the last session offered us the opportunity to do an extended school year that's funded. And so we, are, we may come back to the board with some type of amendment to the calendar um, to extend into the summer if, if necessary. But at this point, that's not something we're ready to even get into yet. There's just lots of pieces that we need to, to put in place first. So that was, I guess that was part of the reason for my question is if we could get some funded time, even if it's for that ramp up week, I'm sure mm -hmm. that it, you know, that would be beneficial to the district as well as to the students. Mm -hmm. um, for those students that might come back with a with an individual education plan um, because they didn't meet standard or wherever we think some kids have some gaps. Um, yeah, I would think that's kind of where my mind was going and I would think that would be something we would consider. Um, I don't know if we have to, what the, probably Mr. Morris or Mr. Scamardo could help us, um, you know, ensure uh, that we are doing it correctly per whatever the, the executive order or the, uh, I guess it was issued as, as an executive order, I'm not 100% sure but just to make sure that we do that such that we could benefit from that. Mm -hmm. No, that was actually legislation. So okay. that's something the TEA has already written rules on and okay. the commissioner brings it up in nearly every meeting I'm in with him, <laughs> but he's wanting districts to use that as part of their strategy for next year. So it's absolutely something that we're yeah. going to give consideration to. Okay, good. Um, and then my last question, um, I, I had did submit the question about construction. So I'm um, thank you, Mr. Perez, um, for giving us that update. And um, it's great to hear that we're even ahead on some of our construction projects. My question was um, one of the questions was around uh, the new high school and just making sure that we're on target to get that. I know we were expediting that, and then even some of our other projects. So it looks like we're on target or ahead of target. And um, thanks to you guys for pushing that through and making sure that we stay on schedule with that. No, no real question, but thank you. Thank you. All right, I think that's it. Thank you, Mrs. Tossan, appreciate it. Mrs. Helliger. All right, thank you. Can you all hear me well? Yes, ma'am. All right, good. All right, so thank you, um, Dr. Dupree, for you really unpacked a lot of information this evening um, around the, kind of the update and the status of kind of where we are today. I do have some questions that kind of um, work with um, what Ms. Tosta has already asked. So before we can get to the opening of the school in August, you mentioned that, or you clarify, I think for a lot of people around, you have to have the T3 pass, you have to have the meets, um, the meets, um, meets requirements. Meet mm -hmm. Yeah, meets, meets standard. So is there going to be, and then you had all these different um, types of scenarios that we may have um, at the end of the school year. How will that be communicated to the parents? And well, so there's several ways. Like, so right now we've got the website. We're doing regular written and video communication on these things. Now, when, now are you asking about just the broad brush or are you asking about their individual students? So I'm asking about individual students because mm -hmm. so is, is the scenario that if you pass T3 and you meet um, standard, then you automatically are promoted? No, and that's, that's one of the things we're trying to get across to folks is that it's not a hard and fast, you have to hit this to get this. Mm -hmm. In the end, what's gonna happen, so I think the way I would like, the way I would compare it to any given school year, teachers have to assess the, whatever the grades on that piece of paper are, did the child, are they really ready to advance to the next grade level? So that piece of the work is typical. And, and that's gonna be done at the school level and news, the, and any information delivered to the, the parent by the campus staff. 
Now, the most recent conversation I've had about that, we were very clear that we need to some type a, a very um, predetermined process to make sure every student gets fair, equitable consideration, no matter what school, no matter what classroom, no matter who's working on it. So there is going to be a process and proper form and documentation so that the parent has something they're given that says here is the what and here is the why and this is how we got here. Mm -hmm. and, and in the end, it's just like any other a hard conversation about retention and promotion, the parent will be part of that conversation. So we're not expect, expecting much retention. What we're really counting on is in the intervention plan. And again, that would be part of that form that would be communicated to the parent in a very formal way. I think that that's what I was looking for, some type of formal communication with, with a parent to say, um, Mm -hmm. to say, um, you know, this is kind of where your, your child stands as of today. And thinking about that, I know we're doing progress reports. Is there a pro is this something that we can provide them prior to the end of the school year? Or is this something that's going to have to wait until we actually end the school year out? You know, Deanna, have you all given, have you had any detailed conversations or Beth or Stephanie or Joe? Can you all weigh in on that particular question? Yes, actually, I'd like Melissa to address that. She can talk through the um, timeline for progress reports and the format for that information. Good. Um, so with the progress reports that were um, provided last week, we did um, provide like a formal communication to campus principals that they would be able to send out um, directly after progress reports that gave some more information for students who did not meet the standard or did not engage. So we've already provided that communication uh, related to progress reports. Um, the next step is um, formalizing some of our promotion retention um, committee works. So it will happen at the campus level, just like Dr. Dupree um, communicated. We won't have the final T4 marks though until the last week of school. So a lot of that communication and decision making will occur um, after final grade, uh, T4 grade, term four grades are posted. Okay, so that's what I wanted to know. So basically, once the, once the term ends, you all will be doing your work and then parents will receive a letter of some, of some sort, um, letting them know where their child stands in this process. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. And, and with the action plan. Yes, ma'am. All right, that's good, thank you. And so my next question was, um, so I kind of chuckled when Dr. Dupree said that he had, his money is on um, option C. And my question is, you have option A and B, but is, is there a reason why we have to do A or B? Um, well, can we opt in? Can people opt in to an option C? Well, so I'll, I'll weigh in on that and others may want to add to that. I think that's under a typical circumstance, the answer would be no. There, because our funding source is based on having, I always say bottoms and seats. Kids have to be in the building to be counted for funding purposes under current state law. So if we're going to do anything on a hybrid level where we're getting credit for kids who are not in the building, it is going to take a special order from the governor, from the commissioner of education with his support. And so that's why, that's why we're having to operate under all three of these possibilities, because I don't think it'll be feasible for us as an organization to try to educate a substantial portion of our population without some sort of funding. Now, we get a lot of funding locally, which is why we may be able to do a small group of students that way for some parents who just say, I'm not gonna do it. But to have a formal system in place, we're gonna have to have support from TEA, um, the commissioner, and probably some special order from the governor to make that happen. And the reason why I ask that question, because I think we have to challenge the system. Mm -hmm. Because some students are doing really, really well in this particular Mm -hmm. scenario you know they're excelling they they can work at their own pace they're managing um the classes i mean this is this is this is what they've ever wanted they don't have to deal with the social 
aspects of school. Um, and so, you know, this pandemic has really opened the eyes to a lot of corporations and school, school business as a corporation mm -hmm. of how we do our current business. And when looking at that, you see corporations are now even from a staff from a staff perspective they found that you know my business is still working uh, with with my my employees working from home so now when you go back to work that model is now different because we've proven that point so not to say that this is something that i i want to do for all our students however i do believe that fundamentally we should be providing in a in a twenty was it twenty first century um, mm -hmm. schools. We should be now providing more options in order to prepare our students because the reality of it is if our kids, you know, they had lots of issues. If, if a lot of them had lots of issues with adapting to this format when they go to college. If we're really preparing them and looking at the profile of a, a graduate, a lot of our st our schools. Our, our our colleges are doing Houston Community College are doing uh, online classes or some type of hybrid uh, mm -hmm. format of that. So that's kind of why I, I was kind of asking that question and wanted to challenge our thinking around that. Yes, ma'am. And, and you may remember back a couple of years ago, we've actually had this conversation in our boardroom about needing this kind of programming. And like you said, the, the pandemic has really put us in a position to try to push the system a little bit. And there is, there's a lot of discussion on the state level about this right now. So I'm hearing it from other superintendents, the commissioners talking about it. So it's very possible even in the next legislative session, starting in January, there could be some movement in this direction to allow funding to go with the student and the services provided, not necessarily just having them in a building. I think it's, I think it's like any other program. I think you put limits on it to offer it up mm -hmm. to students the first people that you know uh, sign up for it and it gives kids a different opportunity to succeed mm -hmm. and then of course there's kids like mine that needs a lot of support mm -hmm. and so right now we are having a hard time personally with keeping up with the school work because just like all the other teachers and principals and everyone else you know working an eight to five job for a child that needs a lot of support is extremely, extremely difficult. Mm -hmm. And so for me, you know, for my household, we need to find some type of format where we can social distance and go to school and, and still provide my child that kind of support. Mm -hmm. um, he may not be on an extreme uh, level as some of our other students, but putting him in a classroom with a smaller, in a smaller group setting, I'm sure, will help him to stay focused during this particular period. And I definitely agree that when we come back in August, the expectation has definitely have to be different. Mm -hmm. So I'm totally supportive of that. I mean, we cannot operate the same way we did now. I mean, this is an emergency situation. Mm -hmm. But now we're giving ourselves time to plan. You're not providing, um, you're taking that July off um, so that we can focus on beginning um, our own mental health as well as preparing for um, the start of the new school year, I think is very important to us and, and important to the success of our district in this coming upcoming school year. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate all the work that you guys have been doing and thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Helliger. Mr. Rice. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I would like to take a moment to thank Dr. Dupree and the executive staff and all of our our staff and teachers for their efforts. And uh, I'm gonna take one moment to repeat much of what Dr. Uh, Dupree has already stated because I think it bears repeating and I can embellish it a little bit more than he could. But I wanna take us back to spring break when we didn't know uh, the Monday before spring break what was gonna happen. And Fort Ben ISD, a district of 78,000 students had to pivot <clears throat> and provide online instruction to all of the students and get the planning going to roll that out in the space of a week. And it may have taken a little bit longer than that to really get up to speed, but it happened 
really in short order. And now we hear from Dr. Dupree that almost 98% of 78,000 students are accessing Schoology and engaging in online instruction. That's pretty good. Uh, in addition, we've passed out laptops that are serving 11,000 students, 1,300 hotspots to, to students who did not have internet service at home. We've been feeding uh, children from 23 of our campuses, 11,000 meals a day, 23 campuses. Think about that. How our staff has to get out to each of these campuses and have the food ready to go and hand out when people drive up to receive that. And um, I know it's stressful. Well, I want to, before I say that, I want to, I want to just tell everybody that, okay, Mr. Perez, we passed a bond in November of 2018, almost a billion dollars. So it didn't get ramped up in 2018. It got ramped up. I know you started it, but when you think about it, we really only had 2019 and five months of 2020. That's 17 months. And to have uh, contracted for all of the work, except for 60 million of an almost $1 billion bond program, is quite remarkable. And to manage that, all of the architects, the contractors, the surveyors, and all of that stuff and keeping track of the money. I know it's, it's still gonna take time to finish the construction, especially on the large projects. That's really nothing short of remarkable. And um, I want our community to know about this kind of stuff. I'm saying a prayer every day that God will remove this blight of this pandemic from the earth so we can get back to work. Uh, I know it's stressful for our teachers, for our administrators and every, everyone, but I'm thankful that we've got funding so that we've been able to pay every single employee at Fort Bend ISD. No one's had to take a pay cut. No one's been furloughed. And that's not true of every industry uh, in society. We have many of those uh, private industries where uh, tens of thousands of people have lost their jobs. So I am very, uh, I am praying that we can get back to work because without the, the, su the, the support of the state budget that comes from sales tax revenue, which constitutes the vast majority of the state's budget, we will have the challenges, not in the next school year, but in the 2021-22 school year. And we, uh, we have been able to weather the storm, I think, because we've had good leadership from you, Dr. Dupree, and your executive team, and also from the board, which has supported you. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's really important. Uh, that everyone know the, the support the board has given the administration. We called off school on Tuesday and the governor called it off on the following Friday. But uh, Dr. Dupree could only have done that with the full support of, of the school board. So I'm mm -hmm. proud to be a part of the school board and for your leadership to Mr. Burdine because it shows how we are getting through this terrible crisis, which we're never gonna forget. We're gonna be telling our grandchildren about it and what we did and how we got through it. But I'm very proud to be a part of this team. And I just wanted to take that moment of personal privilege to share. I'm really glad this is recorded because I want everybody in Fort Bend ISD, all the parents out there to, to watch it and know the contributions uh, that, that Dr. Dupree, everyone at Fort Bend ISD is making, continuing our mission to educate children. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Mr. Rice. We appreciate your comments. Mrs. James. Thank you. Uh, and Mr. Rice, I echo everything that you said. 
um, really the staff effort, the leadership in the district and the staff effort in teaching and learning, construction, child nutrition, every single department, finance, business and finance, everybody has really just done a remarkable job. So I appreciate um, your hearing the statistics of what we've accomplished so I can continue to share the news of that with the community because they are wondering especially even community members who don't who don't have children in school they're wondering what's going on what's happening and so it's really nice to have that those statistics to share with the community and and to share the good news so um, thank you for the report I want to pick up on a couple of things that uh, my colleagues have said and ask a couple of questions. So uh, one was um, Ms. Helliger brought up about online instruction and <clears throat> I appreciated the options you kind of outlined and I know the staff is working on developing those. Is there um, a process that we, that's some school districts in the state have an online learning program. Is, there must be a process to apply for that or to get some kind of, um, you know, permission, if you will, um, to provide that. Is that something that we can look into? I think you must be referring to virtual schools. Is that? Yeah, I'm thinking, I believe, like Grapevine Colleyville has an online program that they run um, and they get have student enrollment from um, all mm -hmm. over the state and I, I, I don't know if there are other, what the other ones are but I know some mm -hmm. I a couple of ISDs have an online learning program yes I believe that'd be part of the virtual schools network and that is something that we it's already on my follow-up list personally that we need to to dig into absolutely that ties with us with what Ms. Helliger was speaking to that I agree, we need to expand that opportunity um, for many of our students. Okay, I, I great, and I think that's a good follow up because um, I agree, and I uh, with, and I've said this a number of times, uh, and I think the board has as well. This is pro this situation has provided us an opportunity for innovation, mm -hmm. and I, I don't want to lose those gains because if I look out. 20 years from now, school, I think, will look differently. And I want us to be poised to, to be the innovators because we've got great leadership in this district. And, and what could that look like and how can we meet the needs of our students in a different way? Ms. Helliger is exactly right because the kids graduate from our schools and then they go to HCC or Wharton County Junior College or many of the large public universities and they take online courses. Mm -hmm. And um, that's a common way for the higher education to be received. So I just want to put it out there as, uh, as something that we should look into. Um, and as we're talking about all these plans, Dr. Dupree, you, met, you kind of outlined three potential plans and I appreciate you know, you're getting those things out there so that the conversation, the community can start. Um, I also, the next time we hear, I just want you to be mindful or just think about um, the anxiety that the teachers may be feeling about how to receive a class of students or classes of students that are arguably a month or two months behind. Mm -hmm. And while the, and I've forgotten the term now, but the, the primary standards or whatever are being taught, some of those um, secondary ones or corollary ones may not be being taught and that's going to hinder the, the teachers in their ability to teach even the material, you know, even their normal class were at work uh, in, at the speed that they normally do mm -hmm. the pacing and we call it i guess we call it pacing yes so i'm just mindful of that and i really feel like we need to be sure that we address the anxiety of these of our teachers when we roll out our plan and there's a couple of so here's my question related to that 
have we received or do we expect to receive guidance from the TEA regarding um, pacing, regarding how to deal with students that arguably have two months of catch up to do, um, regarding situation where we're teaching in one grade while the kids are, you know, progressing maybe through another grade. And then at the end of all that, we've got this thing in Texas we do called testing. And we put so much emphasis on that, mm -hmm. that all it, that, it, that it's, it, well, it's, it's unfortunate to the system. So ha, do you expect any guidance on that? Or maybe you could answer that. So no, I'm going to be honest. I, I do not expect guidance on that because those are truly local decisions about how to, how to handle that, the, the individual student needs. I, the commissioner in, in every meeting I've been in has acknowledged this is a multi-year issue. That being said, I am not hearing any, um, any talk about a second year of no star. Because I, you know, and this is where, and unfortunately we're gonna get in a very uncomfortable position in a year because I believe from what I'm hearing and understanding, they are gonna to wanna to go ahead and do STAR just to see where kids are. The downside to that unless, is, is that unless there is a waiver of the accountability system that's gonna end that result in schools getting grades assigned to them because that's how the state system is structured to work. So my hope is that if they are determined to move forward with STAR in 21, is that they will at least suspend the accountability system and use that data only for diagnostic and analytical purposes without assigning grades and accountability ratings to schools. Because anything they do really for the next two to three years will not be indicative of what schools are doing. Okay, well, I, I completely agree with that. And um, I completely agree with that. And I think that this board as a as a whole would agree with that and i think we are in a position to advocate for the uh and maybe lead some narrative around that topic and uh so i would just encourage you to keep us informed about that mm -hmm. i also will say that, that we're well poised in our community-based accountability system and our other assessment processes that we are developing and working on um in our model that we're developing about um, students owning their own learning and their progress through the curriculum. And I think this is an opportunity for us to accelerate on those in those areas, which are part of our long term visionary and strategic goals, mm -hmm. because I think it will help us. Um, as we have said all along, students when they can make the progress that they can make uh, at their pace and with the, with high expectations in front of them the rest of that testing and the catch-up and all of that will solve itself and so i just want to help us to keep our eye on the horizon of what we're trying to do for the long run and not get caught up um, in short-term labels that will detract from us keeping our strategic goals in place. Mm -hmm. So I, that's a strong statement, but I, I mm -hmm. wholeheartedly believe that we, we cannot lose the vision. We cannot stray from the course, even if it, um, STAR has to continue and such mm -hmm. and we've got to take the pressure off our teachers and the anxiety of that and help them to focus on and understand our long-term goals and the importance of having that long-range look because in the end the students have to have the long-term success and they will have it mm -hmm. if we don't get caught up in little bits of uh star testing so well said thank you 
I have another question. Um, it has to do with your plans. Uh, and I'm excited to hear about the plans for extended day opening um, this week. I think that's very, um, that's really great. And it's a service to our community. And I hope that, um, that as that becomes more and more visible that, that, that essential workers will, will know that they can have their kids well served in Fort Bend ISD. And uh, I appreciate that. Has there been any talk about continuing that in the summer months um, for essential workers or others as space is available? Yes, there has. We're, 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 we see ourselves, and some of this is coming even from the state level, we see ourselves as a resource in that way because we do have the staffing, the buildings to do that. And so, yes, we are expecting to serve that function throughout the summer if needed. Okay, I have seen some, um, some uh, political, some of our uh, fellow, poli some of my fellow politicians um, have put some statements out about that type of thing. So I don't know if we've reached out to our political contingent in Fort Bend County, but we might want to do that um, to make sure they know that this is um, a service that we are uh, beginning. And uh, because I do think it is a great service to the community. And that concludes my questions and comments. Thank you very much uh, for this report. Thank you, Mrs. James. Um, with all that being said, uh, I'll echo every single thing that's been said by my fellow board members. Um, and Mrs. James and Mrs. Helliger brought up a great point about challenging the way that we've done uh, public schools in the legislative session coming up here in January. We always hear all the time about how public schools need to be more innovative and we need to do things different. We've been doing school the same way that we've been doing for the last 100 or 200 years, however long it's been. And so um, I couldn't echo more that this is a real opportunity for us to, to show the state of Texas or even the country how we can do um, some type of blended uh, in-person online learning or maybe all online learning um, and, and do it with fidelity. Um, We've done so much work on our online learning. I'd hate to see all that go to a waste. I think that we can continue, continue to build on that in some capacity for some students. Um, once again, this has already been said, but I just wanna reiterate that. Um, I wanna thank Central Administration, Design and Construction, Dr. Dupree, you and your team. I'd also like to thank, well, first I'd like to say how proud I am, Mr. Rice mentioned this, of. Fort Bend ISD for being able to continue to pay our teachers and continue to keep everyone on the payroll. I'm very proud of that. And I'm going to take the personal privilege to mention um, several of the teachers that I see my kids, Blake and Michaela, working with. Um, Mrs. Callard, who's a kindergarten teacher who engages with her students with her young um, daughter, Charlie, on her lap while she's engaging her whole class which is very impressive. Um, and she does it with a smile on her face. And, um, and Blake's teachers, Mrs. Goodspeed, Mrs. May, and Mrs. Marshall for all of their hard work. Um, it's a pleasure to see them all week. And I know we have thousands of thousands of other teachers out there that are doing amazing jobs, but I wanted to thank all of our teachers because it's not easy. Um, I think all my fellow board members can appreciate uh, what we like to say is pivoting, whether that's pivoting from your day-to-day -day job to board work and back and forth all day long. Um, and I know teachers and central admin and everyone involved in our organization is having to pivot from the way that they've always done things. So I do appreciate that. And I know it's not easy. With that being said, we will now... Jason? Yes, sir. I had a comment. Please. Um, so... I also want to agree with with what Addie and and Grail and Nell you you stated as far as uh, online learning. But um, Charles, you had made a comment uh, a few moments ago saying that um, that um, these are these are supposed to be local decisions, but unfortunately they they they're not because 
because they hold the purse strings. The, the state holds the, holds the purse strings. Mm -hmm. so they're really local decisions. I'd like to see them be local decisions because uh, as, as you know, we always say, you know, all students learn differently. Mm -hmm. And when we had our two students on that panel last month, uh, I had asked, I think she was from Kempner. Uh, yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I asked her the question, do you think that, that online learning works for some students? And, and she had, had said that she liked it. It's not for everybody. And we all know it's not for everybody. But like, like Jason has also reiterated that we've, we've spent a lot of time, not perfect now, but we've, we've, we've learned. And uh, I think that, that there is a place uh, for this in our district. And again, not for everybody. Uh, probably not for most people, but there's um, there's a place for our students, and there's probably a place for our teachers who who are are good at. Um, and so I think that as a school district, uh, we need to join forces with with some of our other districts, and really start to push the TEA and the state that this is viable, this this is this can work, and you shouldn't just pay us on um, butts in the seats, as you say, because uh, it's not right, because it should be a local decision. And if it's working for students, and if it's working for teachers, if it's working for the community, then we should be able to do it. And I was also gonna, gonna you know, bring up the star, but I, I agree with what you said. And I think, again, we need to push back on that. And, mm -hmm. and that's, that's fine to, to take it just to kind of get it, you know, to gauge where what ha what's transpired over the past year, um, but to use it for accountability. I, I, that's I don't think that that's fair. I don't think I don't well one it's probably never fair, but uh, especially at, at, you know after shutting down school for months mm -hmm. and then having to make things up for for a number of students at the beginning of the following year. So I, I really think that we need to, mm -hmm. to have an effort, a joint effort, and to make sure that message gets out. So because I, I think that I'll give them the benefit of the doubt, perhaps maybe they haven't thought about this thing, this type of thing. So anyway, that's all I had to say. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rosenthal. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. I didn't see your chat. Um, all right. Any other trustees have any comments or questions that I haven't seen? With that being said, we will now convene in closed session under the Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code, Chapter 551, under the following sections for the purpose of private consultation with the board's attorney on any or all subject matters authorized by law. We are now convened in closed session. Thank you, Mr. Rozier. We are now reconvening in open session. Next on our agenda this evening is to consider action on closed session items. Mrs. Helliger. Yes, this is Addie Helliger. I move the Board of Trustees accept the superintendent's recommendation to terminate the probationary contract of Maxine Alexandra at the end of the 2019-20 contract year, find it to be in district's best interest and, uh, and authorize the superintendent to provide notice of the board's action. I have a second. Jim, second. Jim Rice, second. All right. We have a motion by Mrs. Helliger and a second by Mr. Rice. I'm going to call everyone's name in, in, a, um, in a particular order here. Please state your name, wait a few seconds, and vote yay or nay. We're going to start with myself. I vote yay. Mrs. Allison Drew. Mrs. Allison Drew. I vote yay. Mrs. Addie Helliger. Mrs. Addie Helliger. I vote yay. Mrs. Grail James. Mrs. Grail James, I vote yay. Mr. Jim Rice. This is Jim Rice, I vote yay. Mr. Dave Rosenthal. This is Dave Rosenthal, I vote yay. And Mrs. Kristen Tossan. This is Kristen Tossan, I vote yay. Motion passes. Mrs. James. I move to award probationary con employment contracts for the 2020-21, okay, let me start over. 
I move to award probationary employment contracts for the 2020-2021 contract year to certified employees as provided under separate cover. This is Jim Rice, I second. We have a motion by Mrs. James and a second by Mr. Rice. Once again, I'll call each board member's name and please state your name and vote yay or nay. Jason Burdine. I vote yay. This is Allison Drew. This is Allison Drew, and I vote yay. Mrs. Addie Helliger. This is Addie Helliger. I vote yay. Mrs. Grail James. This is Grail James. I vote yay. Mr. Jim Rice. This is Jim Rice. I vote yay. Mr. Dave Rosenthal. Mr. Dave Rosenthal. I vote yay. And Mrs. Kristen Tossan. This is Kristen Tossan, I vote yay. Perfect, go ahead, Mrs. James. Thank you, Mr. Burdine. I move to renew term employment contracts for the 2020-2021 contract year to certified employees as provided under separate cover. This is Jim Rice, I second that motion. We have a motion by Mrs. James and a second by Mr. Rice. I will call these board members' names. Please vote yay or nay. Jason Burdine, yay. Mrs. Allison Drew. This is Allison Drew, I vote yay. Mrs. Addie Helliger. This is Addie Helliger, I vote yay. Mrs. Grail James. This is Grail James, I vote yay. Mr. Jim Rice. This is Jim Rice, I vote yay. Mr. Dave Rosenthal. This is Dave Rosenthal, I vote yay. And Mrs. Kristen Tossan. This is Kristen Tossan, I vote yay. All right, go ahead, Mrs. James. I move to award non-Chapter 21 employment contracts for the 2020-2021 contract year to specified directors, executive directors, assistant superintendents, and executive officers as provided under separate cover. This is Jim Rice, I second that motion. We have a motion by Mrs. James and a second by Mr. Rice. I wanted to make a comment that the previous motion passed, excuse me. We have, once again, we have a motion by Mrs. James and a, and a second by Mr. Rice. I'm gonna call each board member's name. Please state your name and vote yay or nay. Jason Burdine, yay. Allison Drew. This is Allison Drew, and I will abstain. Mrs. Addie Helliger. Addie Helliger, I vote yay. Mrs. Grail James. This is Grail James, and I vote yay. Mr. Jim Rice. This is Jim Rice, and I vote yay. Mr. Dave Rosenthal. This is Dave Rosenthal, I vote yay. And Mrs. Kristen Tossan. This is Kristen Tossan, I vote yay. Motion passes. Go ahead, Mrs. James, for the last one. Thank you, Mr. Burdine. I move to award non-Chapter 21 employment contracts for the 2020-2021 contract year to specified non-certified teachers under the district's innovation plan as provided under separate cover. This is Jim Rice, I second that motion. We have a motion by Mrs. James and a second by Mr. Rice. I'm gonna call each board member's name. Please state your name and vote yay or nay. Jason Burdine, yay. Allison Drew. This is Allison Drew, I vote yay. Mrs. Addie Helliger. This is Addie Helliger, I vote yay. Mrs. Grail James. This is Grail James and I vote yay. Mr. Jim Rice. This is Jim Rice and I vote yay. Mr. Dave Rosenthal. This is Dave Rosenthal, I vote yay. And Mrs. Kristen Tossan. This is Kristen Tossan, I vote yay. Motion passes. Moving along to our review agenda, 6A1, review revisions to local board policy. Mrs. James, could you please lead us through this portion of our agenda? Yes, Mr. Burdine, thank you. 
Uh, so there are three policies listed here. The third one is FFA. We've already discussed that. That was handled by the SHAC committee and by staff. The policy committee did not look at that. Um, the, the other two, the first one is BJA, which is a superintendent qualifications and duties. The committee did, um, did uh, review this. And uh, in addition to the items listed in your agenda, um, you sh guys should know this policy is very unique to our district. Um, we're doing this in a different way than other districts. We've talked uh, quite a bit in the policy about the qualities that we expect in a Fort Bend ISD superintendent. We talk about his or her responsibility in management of the district. And most importantly, we emphasize the importance of the team of eight in this policy. Uh, in the next one is CKC, and that's a safety program risk management that focuses on emergency plans. Um, the two things that I'm most proud of in this one that are not listed in your packet are that we've put in here our standard response protocol and um, listed that out, which is um, which is in operation at every campus and every facility. Uh, and then we've also um, put a section in about um, emergency plan annexes or addendums, emergency operation plans um, to be uh, used in unique situations and to be sure that those are written out ahead of time like in case we have a hurricane or a pandemic or a flood or something like that. So um, the committee worked on all of these. So if you have any questions, we're happy to answer them. Thank you, Mrs. James. Is there any questions or comments about these? All right. Thank you to the committee and Mrs. James for leading that and all your hard work. Next on our agenda this evening is 6A2, review the setting, the date, time, and place to conduct a public budget hearing for the proposed 2020-2021 school district budget and tax rates on June 15th, 2020. All right, moving along, please speak up if you have any questions or comments. 6A3, Review the proposed 2020 maintenance and operations tax rate. Yeah, I have a quick question. Go ahead, Mr. Rosenthal. Um, can somebody just uh, briefly explain how the rate was adjusted downward by 0 0.0136 cents? Mr. Rosenthal, this is Brian Gwen. And the rate has been adjusted based on compression that was part of Senate Bill 2. Right. So it represents the highest level of tax rate that we would expect based on state compression of our, uh, due to our higher valuation. So we'll go through the specific mechanics of that adjustment in our presentation next week, but it is a direct relation to that uh, Senate Bill 2. Right. So it was like, 98 cents and so because of the increase in um, tax values they dropped it correct yes sir that is correct okay just want to make sure thank you mr rosenthal any other questions or comments all right moving along to 6a4 review the proposed 2020 debt service tax rate questions or comments all right, moving along to 6B1A, review the purchase of high school sports video editing and statistical analysis software system. Mrs. James. Thank you, Mr. Burdine. Uh, I have a question about this um, equipment. Is this planning to be available in the fall? Um, I do believe it is, Mrs. James. This is long term. Okay, that's great. So I just wanted to tell staff I'm very excited about this because this um, software system has only been available for football in the past. And this, with this um, 
approval. We'll be expanding to volleyball, to basketball, to soccer. It sounded like quite a number of sports. And it'll be available for girls and boys, and it will be available for their own recruitment videos and, um, and uh, footage. So I'm very happy about this, and I appreciate staff for, for getting this uh, together for us. And I hope it's available in the fall so kids can be using it uh, next year. I know that we have to have some installation, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll plan it out as a project. Excellent. Thank you. That's really cool. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, moving, please raise your hand once again if you have a question or comment. Uh, 6C1, review the approval of mental health services grant resolution. Speak up or raise your hand. All right. 6C2, review the waiver for the requirement to provide cardiopulmonary resuscitation instruction to all graduating students. All right. Moving along to 6D1A, review the purchase of RhinoWare door barricade systems for multiple campuses. <clears throat> All right, I'm not missing anyone. 6D1B, review the purchase of medical plan and flexible spending account administration services. I have a quick question. Go ahead, Mr. Rosenthal. <clears throat> so uh, in the summary, it says, uh, as part of UHC's best and final offer, district will receive an increased discretionary budget for wellness of 450,000. Um, can you, somebody describe some of those numbers and, and what that means to us? There's another number of 640,000 and then uh, 689,000 at risk. Mr. Gwynn, could you answer that? He's looking to see if Sonia Curtis, our benefits uh, director with our payroll and benefits director was on board who specifically would have information about that. She was on the call. Sonia, are you still here? Yeah, She's still here. here. Can you please respond to that? Okay, so um, with the 600, I'm sorry, with the um, additional wellness money, we normally use that toward, um, <clears throat> excuse me, like our activities regarding um, our wellness programs, like uh, Zumba classes, it's pretty much our after hours classes, Zumba. Um, I'm trying to think of all these little classes we have. The boot um, camps and those kinds yeah, of things. Yeah, the boot camps and so forth. So we use that money to help with all our wellness programs for our employees. Sonia, does it pay salary for Gary or any of those folks as well? No, the salary is not part of the wellness dollars. Okay. So they're giving us, if we sign this contract, they're giving us $450,000. So currently we do get money from UHC that does cover our Zumba classes, our boot, you know, our boot camp classes. So we'll have additional funds um, to use toward um, any additional wellness programs that we may choose. It's also, doesn't it go to like incentives to campuses as well when we have weight loss challenges and lots yeah, of with different with our challenges, types of any of Yes, with any of our programs that we use, we would use that money. So, you know, if we were to have a program um, and it would be an award for the, the best, you know, the campus with the highest weight loss or whatever, um, you know, that campus would get allocated so much money for winning um, that particular program. So anything wellness related um, that we have, we have those funds to use that without using any ad additional district funds. Okay, so is that what that 640,000 is too? That's, that's additional wellness benefits? Let me bring this up here. Do we know what that is, Brian or Gwen? Um, LaShonda, are you, are you available? Yes, I'm here. Perfect. Can you answer this question for us? LaShonda is our assistant director of our benefits program. Yes, so the additional 600000 that United Healthcare is contributing, that is actually a one-time annual 
um, additional discretionary fee that they threw in as part of the RFP. And so those dollars are actually there for us to use at will. And so I know there have been some discussions of maybe using it to offset some of the additional claims costs that we will see over the next two years. But that is just a one-time annual fee that will be available to us. And going back to the additional wellness fund, um, so we also used, used that money to pay for employee services such as flu shots, um, on-site mammograms, as Sonia stated, the virtual fitness classes. So there are a number of employee programs around wellness and mental health that those dollars are also used for. Okay, so I get the wellness stuff, the 640,000, why don't they just knock that off the, the contract price if they're just gonna give it back to us anyway, it seems kind of strange. Um, well, and, then, and then the 689,000, can you explain what that is? So going back to the discretionary amount, I would say one of the reasons why they didn't specifically take that off the, the total dollar amount is so that if we wanted to use those funds for additional programs, around benefits and wellness, it will give us an opportunity to do that. The additional $600,000, $50,000 that you're seeing, that is basically related to our PGs, the performance guarantees. And so those are dollars that are basically wrapped up into the performance such as customer service, such as claims processing. And so if United Healthcare fails to meet those performance standards that we have in place, we have that amount that's set aside that they potentially could pay us if they don't meet those expectations. Okay, thank you. Was, was there some concern? I, I don't know. I don't think they've resolved their their dispute with uh, Methodist. Um, is it was there is there con, is there concern on the part of district employees about that? So at this time, there's not. And the reason being is that we currently have a single case agreement in place that directly with Methodist and so therefore our employees are still able to receive the benefits as a network status for Methodist Hospital. Um, I will tell you as of last week the most recent re um, update we received from United Healthcare is that they have gone back to the table with Methodist and they're hoping to have a response for us within the next week. And right. it looks favorable but of course there's nothing officially that's been announced at this time. Mr. Rosenthal, I would also add that there are two other large benefits administration programs that have been in conflict in the past. So there's no guarantee that if we move to a, a different vendor that we wouldn't experience the same, you know, issue down the road. Right. Got it. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rosenthal. Thank you for uh, LaShonda and our Mrs. Walls and Mrs. Curtis for your your help, Mr. Gwynn. Moving on to 6E1, review the recommendations for the new positions to support Fort Bend ISD strategic priorities for the 2021 school year. I, th I think uh, maybe this item is pulled, well, Dr. Dupree. I was just about to ask, was this the pulled item, Dr. Dupree, 6E1? Uh, this is the Yes, it is. Okay. 6E1 has been pulled. Excuse me. 6E2, review the 2021. Has this been pulled as well, Dr. Dupree? This one has been revised and replaced with a new item. Um, Brian, do you want to review that very quickly? 6E2? Yes, uh, on the compensation. Okay. Yes, sir. So as part of the compensation item, the two of the largest components that were included in the agenda item were for a retention supplement for non-teaching staff, and then the teacher step increase of $500. Both the teacher step increase and the retention supplement for $500. We have removed both of those components from the plan, so what would remain in the general fund would be the equity adjustments, reclassification, and adjustments, and calendar adjustments, and those together total just under $600,000. So, in the general fund is where the primary impact is, and that's been reduced by about $4.9 million from what it was previously downward. And then the same impact would be in the child nutrition fund where we have re removed the retention supplement at 295,000. And again, an extended learning removed the retention supplement that was 176,000. So when we bring forward the final item for your consideration next week, the agenda item will not reflect those costs, nor will the forecast. 
And I would like to just jump on and, and speak to that because in, since this item was publicly posted, um, I, I'm sure some members of our community have reviewed it. We are making this change because the agenda was prepared and posted for the board and public last week, just as the Texas Comptroller was, make, was issuing some critical economic indicators for the state. And at, at, over the weekend, reviewing that information in light of where we know the state budget is going over the next two to three years, we felt like it would be prudent to pull back on that investment of that $6 million right now, because we're probably going to need it in the next couple of years to continue advancing our work, either in compensation or other priorities. Um, due to House Bill 3 last year, staff received generous raises for this year. And I, and I don't want this to be any indicator that we don't value all that's going on during the pandemic right now in our emergency response. But all, as was previously noted, all of our employees are currently employed and being fully compensated. And so we believe just due to the economic condition of our state and community, we need to be sensitive to our long-term organizational needs and it's more prudent to pull back now to be able to invest a little more later, which is why we pulled back um, on those items. The items that remain, we do believe are important because we do want to stay competitive in the market. And so we, are, we have consistently reviewed stipends and equity pay. And so we believe this, this, we have this money we have remaining is um, a worthwhile and necessary investment to keep staff um, fairly paid in the market. This is James, did you have a question? Yes, I, I have a question. So I'm, I'm looking, I have a printed copy actually, as I printed the new version of it. And when you, on the table that's, and it, things are, are labeled equity adjustment. So what, is, what does that mean? What is that? So each year we look at both internal and external equity. External equity would be looking at market uh, posi positions within our market, other districts that we're competing against, or perhaps even businesses that we compete against. Internally, we're looking for equity among our employee groups. So this year, the bulk of the uh, 102,000 is going toward bus monitors. We had TASB come in and, and do a review on those um, that job group, and so we're making some equity adjustments there. In addition, we are adjusting uh, our executive assistance, so our administrative support group, and, and those are the bulk of, of them, and then we have a few others that they recommended a small dollar amount. And so these are equity adjustments to make those positions marketable or competitive with our neighboring districts. Yes, ma'am. Can you describe it? Okay. Yes, so bus monitors and the administrative assist or executive assistants. Okay, and then reclassifications, what does that mean? So the reclassifications would be when we conduct a review, uh, either a leader makes a request each year for us to look at particular positions that may have evolved over time and so uh, the scope of work that they're doing may have increased uh, or their responsibilities have increased. And if we find that that has happened, then we would make a recommendation to move them from one pay grade, one classification to another classification. And so we have a total of, I believe, eight positions that we're recommending um, this year. Okay, so our list or at least the one i'm looking at says 29 that that might so i don't uh, know 29 employees it's eight positions ah got it mm -hmm. okay got it um okay and then stipends those are um uh, like supplemental pay for some type of additional responsibility yeah, so the stipends are uh, additional duties that teachers receive. 
on top of their teaching responsibilities and we are looking at existing stipends and making adjustments. Again, we went out to market to do comparisons against other school districts and found that we needed to make a few adjustments there. All right, and then the calendar adjustments, is that, an, well, I'll let you explain what it is. I won't guess. Okay, uh, the bulk of the money there is around calendar adjustments for our child nutrition department. Uh, they're looking to extend the calendar for, for uh, their managers. And, um, and then we have two positions in our student support services area specifically our special education, where they're looking to make uh, calendar adjustments to allow for flexibility within their work calendar due to their organizational needs. Okay, thank you very much. It's very You're helpful. Welcome. Thank you, Mrs. James. <clears throat> Moving along to 6E3, review the low attendance days and missed instructional day waivers. 6E4, review the 2021 designated hazardous traffic conditions list and adoption of the designated hazardous traffic conditions resolution. Mr. Burdine, I would indicate, share with the board that we caught some errors in the actual list, nothing that is substantive, just some corrections. And so the list itself will change with a few minor adjustments next week when we post it for actual for action. And we'll point out to the board what changed. Okay, thank you, appreciate that update. 6E5A, review the purchase of consulting services for Medicaid and student health related services billing. 6E5B, review the purchase of facilities, operations, ground supplies, equipment, repairs, and related items. Um, 6E5C, review the purchase of HVAC equipment, supplies, services, controls, and related items. 6E5D, review the purchase of milk, juice, and related items. 6E6A, review the use of the 2014 bond program contingency as proposed. 7A, review construction services agreement with Prime Contractors Incorporated for exterior envelope renovations and repairs at multiple campuses. <clears throat> 6E7B, review the construction services agreement with Unify Energy Solutions, LLC, for HVAC controls at multiple campuses. 6E7C, review construction services agreement with Jordan Enterprises, I hope that's right, Jordan Enterprise LP for site work renovations at multiple campuses. All right, next on our agenda is our audience items. I believe we have one speaker this evening. Is that still correct, Mr. Rozier? Yes, sir. All right, <clears throat> the board encourages and welcomes comments and input from our patrons, but we cannot respond, deliberate, or decide regarding any subject that is not included on the posted agenda. Please limit your comments to three minutes, and please refrain from mentioning a student or employee's name when voicing a concern or complaint as board policy provides alternative pro procedures through the grievance process policies GF local or DGBA local to seek resolution to complaints. The superintendent's office, human resources and administration in general can assist you in finding these procedures online. The following procedures will apply to tonight's audience comments. One, I will read the name of the citizen registered to speak and share that they will have three minutes to make their comments. Two, prior to speaking, the citizen must press star 67 to unmute their phone. Number three, once the citizen starts his or her comments, Mr. Rozier, the board's 
Recording secretary will announce when the speaker has 30 seconds remaining. And four, once the citizen has concluded his or her name or his or her comments, Mr. Rozier will mute the citizen's phone line. All right. I am looking, Mr. Rozier, you wanna, here we go. I have Glenda McCall. Good evening, Dr. Dupree, President Burdeen, and esteemed board members and staff. First, I'd like to thank you for the incredible job that you've done handling this pandemic shutdown and the online learning process and the efforts you have made in developing a rigorous academic curriculum for students. I commend you on your efforts. Fort Bend AFT surveyed our teachers in an effort to, to gauge how well our teachers are doing with online instruction, and the results were enlightening. 70% of our respondents reported working more than eight hours, eight hours a day, while 23% of those reported working 12 to 15 hours a day. They expressed concerns with balanced work hours while simultaneously caring for their own children. 40% reported having to engage in three to five meetings and 23 reported attending, attending six to 10 meetings a week. They expressed the meetings were long and unnecessary. 78% expressed concerns with student engagement and equity issues for their students. They cited that families are experiencing COVID in their own families, are essential workers, do not have adequate internet service or are frustrated with the amount of work that caused them to avoid engaging. 40% stated that many of their students still did not have adequate internet services. 38% reported frustrations with directives given after hours with insufficient time to complete them. Finally, we asked our respondents what they wanted admin to know and they cited unrealistic fed expectations and excessive paperwork inadequate and unreliable internet access for teachers and students, inconsistent and unclear grading expectations. Some of the actual comments were, administrators at my campus are doing a great job, but I've gotten feedback from parents and students and teachers are giving too much work. Instead of adding more and more rigor, we need to make, make um, need to not make this harder or more frustrating on teachers and parents who have to help with younger learners. There needs to be more grace given to parents and students who cannot meaningfully engage in the assignments due to prohibitive circumstances. These are just a few of the comments. So I'll leave you with a final comment from the survey. Everyone has gone above and beyond. 30 seconds for remaining. For our, kids. for our kids. Everyone stay strong and keep up the good work. If you'd like more information on this survey, I'd be happy to provide that information to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. McCall. We appreciate your comments this evening. <clears throat> Next on our agenda are action items. We do not have any this evening. So the last, may I have a motion to adjourn in a second? I move that we adjourn. This is Grail James, I second. We have a motion by Mrs. Hellier and a second by Mrs. James. This meeting is now adjourned. Thank you all for being here this evening. <laughs>